Good morning, everyone. Can I have your uh, attention here? Uh, welcome to CSIS. My name is Johanna Nesseth, and I'm uh, Senior Vice President here, and I co-direct our project on U.S. Leadership and Development. I um, want to welcome you today. This is a part of our Chevron Forum series on development, and um, we're really pleased to have you here. Uh, Scott Miller, who has put our program together and is going to moderate and sort of uh, facilitate the entire discussion today, just said this is like a, a brief crash seminar on global value chain. So I hope you all will be prepared for your certificates at the end of this. Um, I, I want to make a note about why we're doing this under a development tent, because it's part of a much broader effort. And I hope that you all will um, think about it, give us feedback, take this back to your sort of your offices and your teams and your thinking. Uh, we have had a project underway for the past three years. It's a partnership with Chevron looking at the role of the private sector and business community in development. In March, we put out a major publication. It was the result of a one-year-long sort of commission process co-chaired by um, Tom Daschle, Vin Weber, Carly Fiorina, uh, former CEO of Hewlett Packard, and uh, Tom Pritzker, who's the CEO of the Hyatt Corporation, and then uh, with Henrietta Four as our honorary co-chair. And we really spent a year looking at how the private sector is engaged in development, looking at current capital flows to developing countries, and, and the role that the private sector has taken, um, sort of to all of our surprise as we look back, um, it's just a really dominant role in engaging and investing in developing countries and, and trying to find ways that the U.S. government can work more closely together with the private sector, or at least facilitate that type of investment in a way that promotes development. So as we have looked at the follow-on discussions, as we've briefed out the report, as we've talked to different folks, um, I think an interesting thing that we found is that the development community is pretty much on board with this idea now. For a while, they were maybe a bit resistant because it was a little uncomfortable to think about multinational companies engaging in developing countries. It was, it was, there were some uncomfortable things about it. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, AID has really embraced this. MCC and other groups um, really want to see it move forward, still trying to figure out the best way. But the, the private sector, the business community, the commerce and trade folks are still they're, they're trying to do business, and they're, trying to, they're not quite sure where this fits in their process of doing business. So I think one of our hopes today is we really look at how business intersects here and how it actually can be good for business. So it's not just sort of part of your corporate social responsibility activities, but there's really an integrated way um, to pro promote economic growth uh, through business operations, activities, and processes. So we're going to start today with um, a set of remarks by Dr. Nancy Lee. Uh, Nancy is the general manager of the Multilateral Investment Fund at the International American Devel or, um, Inter American Development Bank. She's uh, quite a Latin Americanist. She served as the deputy assistant secretary for the Western Hemisphere at the Department of Treasury. So she's got a strong sort of finance and trade background, having worked on NAFTA and Uruguay, Uruguay round negotiations, but also has worked a lot on development. Spent a year at the Center for Global Development. So she's really a an ideal person to talk through some of these uh, issues with us. Uh, following her remarks, we're going to dive in, and Scott's going to take us through a set of discussions on sort of how uh, global value chains, global supply chains work, and what are some opportunities to really look at those more carefully and thoughtfully. So with that, I'm not going to give much more of an introduction because you've got her bio, but welcome, um, Dr. Lee, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us. I hope you'll be able to participate and take away a number of ideas from today. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is a... Um, this is an honor to be here and really a pleasure. And I, I have to start by congratulating CSIS on convening us all around these topics, development, uh, trade, and value chains. <clears throat> it's a very hot topic. I, I know there are, there's a, a large part of the development community in the audience as well as the uh, public sector. And it's also a topic in which there is a lot of innovation going on, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, social business models, which converge with value chains. So, um, and as a development practitioner, as well as an economist, um, I would say some of our most impactful projects are in the area of uh, value chains because of their sustainability, their commercial sustainability, their scalability, the ability to reach 
really thousands of small actors and low-income actors, and they're very low cost in terms of public subsidies in order to make them work. A as you will see from what I'm about to describe, because um, I'm going to show you a few project examples, um, the difficulty is actually not finding the finance. It's more convening the partners um, that you need to convene in order to solve the collective action problems. But that's, of course, inherent in value chains. <coughs> but uh, let me just, uh, com I'm, I'm going to use a PowerPoint, and you're going to understand why as we get further into it. Um, to summarize what I'm, I'm hoping to cover, I want to tell you a little bit about the Multilateral Investment Fund. I realize it's not a household name, and I want to um, describe what it is. I'm going to give you the sort of three-minute version of the evolution in support of SMEs in value chains, talk about what's changing in terms of the motivation of large firms. Um, as, as we just heard, there, there, there's sort of a change in the attitude of the private sector, um, and talk about what that implies for capturing value for small actors, uh, talk to you about five project examples, and then I also want to talk to you about value chain finance, which is a which is a key part of making all of this work. <coughs> so the Multilateral Investment Fund is actually a, bar a bipartisan um, child originally of the Bush I administration and then launched in the Clinton administration about 20 years ago. Um, it was a very innovative organization from the start. It's best understood as the laboratory inside the Inter-American Development Bank. We were always supposed to innovate, take risk, and do things on a small scale in order to identify models that can be scaled. So our, our donors are exceptionally tolerant of risk. Our clients are micro and small firms, small farms, and poor and lo low income households. We are not organized by sector. We're organized in an access framework, the tools to empower our clients, access to finance, access to markets and skills, and access to basic services and green growth. Unusual among development organizations, we can do grants, equity, and loans, and in fact, most of what we do are grants and equity. It's 90% of, um, of our annual approvals, 70% um, grants, 20% equity, and then 10% loans. Um, we never do a project if we can't find somebody else to co-finance with us. 45% of our staff are on the ground. We have 39 donors, which you'd think would be a nightmare in terms of governments, but, but they're pretty happy with what we do. We only do $100 million a year total, and we do about 90 projects, which gives you a sense of the scale of our projects. Very, very small. This is another metaphor for us, um, a bridge, or in this case, a gear. Um, we are much too small to substitute for private finance, so we have to essentially address the market failures, which are um, uh, preventing the flow of market finance. That's why we need grants to fill information gaps, address skill deficits, um, help build the regulatory systems. That's, you know, why we're engaged with the public sector as well as the private sector. Strengthen private sector institutions like financial institutions, farmer cooperatives, things like that, and convene actors and using the equity in particular to share risk. The, this, the scale of this is completely off. Obviously, we're a very, very small gear. Public sector and private sector are very, very big gears. But as I think physics tells us, you know, if you're a small gear and you're driving bigger gears, you're magnifying the force of the bigger gears, which is, I think, what our donors want us to do. <coughs> so this is uh, 20 years or 15 or 20 years of empowering four, four small firms, at least from our perspective and I think the perspectives of some other uh, development actors. The focus in the mid-90s when we were founded was very much the enabling environment, the policy, regulatory, legal environment, that this was um, the time when in order to help a small firm, what we did is train them in business development services individually. Um, the doing business reports uh, came into play in, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. We worked with sectoral clusters that's horizontal linkages between small firms within a sector. It's a, it was very much drawing on a European model. And with inward-looking incubators, that is incubators which essentially took entrepreneurs out of the world, isolated them so that they could think about and be creative about uh, creating their firms. That was the kind of incubator that we 
supported um, in the early 2000s wasn't very successful. Then you had, um, in the middle 2000s, the advent of direct involvement of anchor firms, which changed really the dynamics. So the anchor firms became the driver of SME development and, um, the, and, and linking SMEs to each other and to larger value chains. And so we, and we then saw the rise of the term inclusive business, shared value. Um, the incubator concept changed radically, so we, um, we moved into things that called accelerators, which are um, uh, entities which work with startup entrepreneurs not to isolate them, but to connect them with business networks, with mentors, with funders. So it was much, it was a reverse of the concept. It was, it was how do you connect a nascent entrepreneur with, with all of the players that he or she needs to be connected with. And now you could say that we've entered a third phase, which is, which is the social innovation and social business model phase, which is kind of overlapping shared value, where um, we are now much more focused on businesses which create social value. Um, this term social business model is kind of used very loosely. People have different definitions. Some people define a social business, business as simply a business that produces a good or service which has social value and particularly can be consumed by low-income populations. That's not how we define it, um, although, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that, um, you know, is, it doesn't have a one definition. We define it as a business that um, uses part of its returned to fund something that has social value. So the good and or service that it sells in and of itself doesn't have to be a socially relevant product or service, but it has to use part of its revenues to then fund something that benefits a community. So I said that there was a change um, in, in the um, perspective of, of large firms, and some of you in the audience are large firms. I'm just going to tell you what what we're hearing from the firms that come to us that want to do pro products, projects. The first thing we hear is that they want to engage with SMEs in their value chains for cost reasons. Um, in Latin America and the Caribbean in particular, um, there is a strikingly large gap in productivity between large and small firms, and a corresponding gap in cost structures of large and small firms. So if you're a large firm, you have a very powerful incentive to source some of your value from uh, SMEs as a cost-cutting tool. In addition to that, um, there is the, the greater emphasis on greening production chains means that you have to focus on your SME suppliers because as, as we'll see in a second, they are a principal source of CO2 emissions. So if you want to green your value chains, cut the costs, um, you need to focus on SMEs. I'm talking totally here about business model reasons, nothing to do with CSR. Um, for commodity purchasers, there's a powerful um, desire to uh, have small producers organized, um, improve in productivity, improve in quality so that you can be assured of a growing stable source of commodities. In Latin America, a lot of the coffee production, cocoa production, stevia production, sesame, amaranth, quinoa are small producers. And if you're Kraft or Starbucks or Nestle, you don't want to get into the business of organizing thousands and thousands of small producers and teaching them how to produce the product with your quality standards. You want help with that. <clears throat> and finally, um, you have these upwardly mobile populations in Latin America as well as other emerging markets. Um, these are the middle class, but also a, uh, what's being called the vulnerable class, which is a class which has risen out of poverty. It has not yet reached um, uh, middle class income levels, but its consumption patterns are changing. So if you want to reach that population and you're a large firm, you are naturally focused on women entrepreneurs because you know that women largely control household consumption decisions. So firms come to us and say, we want to reach women. It's logical for us to engage with women entrepreneurs 
because we're pretty confident that they would they are they can be a force for marketing effectively to women in addition to that you can't o only rely on large-scale retail if you're trying to reach populations that are outside urban areas that are hard to reach by standard um, retail stores so you need to have distribution chains with small actors that allow you to re reach you know urban area peri-urban areas rural areas so there are distribution regions reasons that you have to um, uh, work with small actors so it's not the CSR has disappeared it's that there are a lot of commercial reasons that firms want to engage with small actors <coughs> so I wanted to just show you um, a cross-country um, view of the challenge of capturing value uh, if you're a developing country. Um, and this is an example which is a little uh, outdated at this stage. It's an, it's an iPod example. Um, and it shows you the distribution of value in producing an iPod in kind of three slices. The first slice is the tech-heavy slice. The middle slice is assembly. And the uh, third slice is design and distribution and what you can see is that the value is concentrated in the tech heavy slice and the design and distribution slice and that tells you if you're a developing country you need to be able to move uh, grab value from those um, those parts of the production process and of course if you're China with rapidly rising w wage rates um, you're your uh, competitiveness in the assembly um, slice is eroding over time, which is another driver to, to move to these, to these other areas. So, so that has implications for the kind of development project you can do in order to grab those slices of value. Uh, one other example of this, which is the agricultural value chain. And we wanted to show you um, a coffee value chain, the old-fashioned traditional coffee value chain, and the fair value coffee chain value chain and so on the top you can see that the uh, for the producing country the traditional coffee value chain has a fragmented set of actors it has small farmers it has some intermediary between the farmers and the processing plant and then it has a local exporter and the small producers themselves capture a very small share of the value six percent others in the producing company country around 11%, so we're talking about, you know, maximum 20% of value in the producing country, 80% of the value in the consuming country. The fair value of coffee chain, of course, increases the absolute value of the whole coffee chain because of the price premium, but it also redistributes the share of value among the actors. So you can see the rise of farmer cooperatives under the fair value fair trade coffee chain, which um, represents the consolidation of market power. In other words, the, farmer, the small farmers become members of cooperatives, and the cooperatives organize them, um, uh, increase the quality of the product and the volume of the product and the consistency of the product. They also start to capture part of the processing value. So. Uh, all of which gives the producers a much larger share of the overall value. Um, in this particular example, 29%. So we've, we shifted from a sort of 2080 um, producer, consumer country sh share to a 40-60 uh, share. And in some cases, the farmer cooperatives export directly to the roasters, which captures even more of the shares. <coughs> so what does all this mean if you're, trying, if you're a development practitioner and you're trying to figure out how to um, increase the market power of small actors. It means that you need to be fo focused on competitiveness, on productivity, on technology upgrading, skills development, and greening value chains, working with small actors to green value chains. Um, branding certification and standards has high potential for uh, increasing value. Um, you need to worry about how to make small scale distribution chains more productive. Um, and more attractive to large companies, um, searching for distribution uh, channels which reach new consumers. If, if possible, you need to get small actors involved in product innovation and design. 
Um, pursuing social business models is also an effective channel, which I'll come back to. And then you need to worry about the, fin the, the finance problem, how to finance these small actors. So these are, what I want to do is I want to show you a development project that is an example of each of these uh, channels. Oh, but first, just, uh, just, this is just to give you a sense of the kind of partners that come forward uh, and work with us. And I know many of you from development agencies work with the same partners, but you can see we're talking about a whole range of large companies, um, commodity purchasers, uh, infrastructure um, companies, um, retail distributors, um, uh, uh, you know, consumer goods um, producers. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide variety of companies that are interested in um, this kind of activity. So this is the first uh, project example. This is an example of a project where Walmart and FEMSA Mexico, the, the Coke bottler, um, came to us to work with us on greening their value chain. Um, and they did that um, partly for corporate social responsibility reasons, but also partly for cost reasons. And also, I would say, because there's an increasing understanding now, which I think is fairly new, that small companies are actually um, dominant players in CO2 emissions. Um, whereas, you know, two or three years ago, I think people would focus on working with large companies if you're, if you're interested in reducing emissions. People now, um, having done studies that audit CO2 emissions throughout the value chain, understand that actually um, the, the majority of emissions comes from this, the small uh, suppliers. The 86% the that you see in the second bullet comes from an energy audit done by Siemens. Um, so between investor and shareholder pressure to green, um, cost issues, government client issues, there's a lot driving the desire to work with SMEs on value, on, on uh, greener technology. Um, in, in our region in particular, um, the customers are also driving uh, this interest because um, they are actually demanding uh, greener pro products. So here's what the project looks like. And this, there's gonna be a, this, is why, this is why I insisted on doing a PowerPoint here. It's kind of complicated to explain verbally. There's gonna be a common thread in all of these projects. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you're going to see that they're all very inexpensive. They're all going to be less than $10 million total. And you see always the MIF contribution and the contribution from our counterpart co-financers. Um, so money is not the issue. It's the convening that is the difficult issue. So in this particular case, the MIF, FOMINE in Spanish, funds an executing agency, uh, number two, Tec de Monterrey, which is um, a prominent in Mexican university. They develop an online pr platform to train SMEs in uh, identifying their energy cost structures and in uh, auditing their value chains. Um, the anchor firm, Fence and Walmart, um, encourages their SME suppliers to, to achieve CO2 emissions goals. Um, we mobilize green technology providers to provide the kinds of technologies which will uh, allow the firms to reduce their CO2 emissions. And then we partner with a financial institution to finance the SMEs to purchase the green technology, which in this case is Banorte. So in that way, you can use the power of the anchor company to motivate these changes. You can reach 3,000 MSMEs. Um, and you, 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 the anchor companies are a powerful force, obviously, in motivating um, their, um, their uh, suppliers. And then once you develop this online platform, you can use it for many, many companies and for many, many uh, anchor firms. So it's a tool that's obviously scalable uh, and really becomes a public good. Uh, second example, um, mangoes in Haiti. So this is, this is now working with farmers. Um, Haiti used to be actually a um, significant mango exporter. It's still one of the 20 largest mango producers, but now it exports only less than 5% of its production. 
um, because in w uh, largely because of weaknesses in the value chain. So the idea is to enhance small farmers' capacity to produce and transport exportable quality uh, mangoes. And, and the goal that was set for that um, project is to double these farmers' um, mango um, income. So in this case, we have a, another complex, the, the whole thing, again, it's less than $10 million. We have a complex chain which starts with funders. USAID is one, AID is one of the funders. Coke is one of the funders, et cetera. The executing agency is, agency is TechnoServe. TechnoServe trains the farmers, trains the uh, producer associations, which are farmer cooperatives. Um, in order to produce exportable mangoes, um, the exporters then export uh, at the moment to Whole Foods. And we're proud to say that every single Whole Foods store in this country uh, sells Haiti mangoes in season. Um, and there's a financial institution, Sojitsol, which is a microfinance institution, which finances, actually this is a little bit misleading. It actually finances the, the individual farmers <coughs> with microfinance loans. So we're reaching 25,000 farmers. Hasn't been easy. And we, we've learned along the way, we're gonna have to do more than correct the value chain uh, issues. We're gonna have to help the farmers plant new mango trees. Um, but I think we'll, we're pretty confident we're going to achieve the results. Um, here is a distribution example um, with Saab Miller, the, the beverage producer, as the anchor firm driver. <coughs> and, so th and Saab Miller, like Coke and like um, other beverage producers, is facing a kind of saturated market in the ur urban areas. So if they're trying to expand their customer base, they need to move outside the urban areas and find... Uh, distribution channels, and what they want to do is help family-owned stores um, to become more productive and growing um, distributors. That helps, obviously, the, the mom-and-pop stores, but it also helps them reach new clients. So this is this project. Again, um, you have a funder. You have an executing agency. This is a regional project, so the executing agency um, is going to vary by country. It uh, trains the small shopkeepers, many of whom are women. Um, and by doing so, it, uh, Saab can sell more to those um, women-owned small shops. Um, there's a microcredit supplier to the small shops to allow them to expand. Um, and this becomes a social business model because then those women-owned shops become community uh, leaders. And there are knowledge partners that teach the women um, to, pr to um, provide other services in their communities where they are major actors. Um, education services, um, access to other kinds of services like insurance, um, uh, uh, you know, various kinds of um, community building activities which can be uh, driven by convening around these uh, small shops. Um, this uh, is an attempt to get small actors involved in product innovation. Wakami is a global brand of artisan jewelry. I think it's just jewelry. Um, uh, and this is, an, this is a, a project which um, reaches rural women rural poor women in Guatemala and connects them to that value chain um, and helps them capture some of the value of the product innovation. By the way, the, this, this bracelet is a, an example of the product innovation. These are Wakami um, bracelets. So in this case, you have the funder engaged with an NGO, Communities of the Earth, which, which is the instrument to connect with the individual women producers. Um, and that NGO is funded by an anchor firm, which is a commercial firm, which is the merchandise distributor and the source of product design and the source of training of the women to, to participate in product design. So for example, these bracelets were partly designed by the women in the rural areas based on the, the um, materials they had available to them. Then the product is sold by Wakami on a website or in retail um, uh, outlets in Europe and the United States. And then the communities benefit from the activities 
um, driven by the women. And again, these are education, health insurance uh, activities. So part of the value that produced by selling this jewelry goes back to um, invest in the communities. Um, one more model, uh, which is um, very different, which is using the power of outsourcing to connect with small actors. And this is a company, um, Digital Divide Data, which outsources computer services to young people um, and then uses part of the value of the business to fund university scholarships. So just to go to the, the project. So we fund DDD. It then provides computer services to companies like Reader's Digest and World Vision. You know, their digitalization services, their, their data entry, um, using these young people. Um, the, the young people are paid for their services, so they get income. And then part of the profits made by DDD go to educational institutions to provide scholarships for the young people. So this is a very sophisticated social business model in which um, you're trying to capture more value uh, through entering sort of tech services and then take some of that value and uh, invest in young people. Again, the, the whole project costs $2.6 million, um, very sustainable. Okay, um, I, I just want to um, mention two projects that have to do with value chain finance because obviously finance um, is a critical component of a lot of these models. And um, I want to mention a, one particularly innovative model called, that's, that's run by Treffy in Peru, just because it's one of the, the most scalable and innovative that we know about, um, and maybe some of you know about it as well. So it's basically a model which uses a um, computer information system to uh, assess the creditworthiness of small-scale distributors of um, products produced by large companies. That's, that's in, in a nutshell. So here's the, here's the uh, schematic. Starting with uh, step two, the small enterprises are um, shops, small distributors. They buy products from Procter & Gamble, Diageo, you know, um, soap products, um, beverage products and distributed them. They then owe the corporate supplier um, a receivables. So you, you have accounts receivables which are then held by the corporate supplier. That corporate supplier, which you know, is, is reluctant to do a lot of um, supplier credit to these small shops because it's very hard to assess their capacity to repay then takes those accounts receivable and sells them to a special purpose vehicle. And wh what I'm basically describing is going to be an asset-backed security. Okay. They s sell at a discounted price. The cash then goes back to the corporate supplier. That special purpose vehicle creates an asset-backed security. The role of Treffy, and this is the innovation that makes it work, is to use big data to assess the creditworthiness of each of these thousands of small enterprises. All kinds of data, you know, bank data, tax data, social media data, um, to create models that predict their creditworthiness. And that's why the special purpose vehicle then can get a, a risk rating for these asset-backed securities and actually slice the risk up to sell to different investors. And in the initial pilot, Cofide, which is a public development bank, brought the asset-backed securities. I wanted to show this because this is very scalable. And of course, once you create one of these big data platforms, it's inherently scalable. Um, uh, you, you know, the startup costs are the highest costs. Adding more data um, uh, actually is, uh, the, has a very small marginal cost. So we have 8,000 firms that have been served so far in Peru. Um, we're very confident it can be scaled in other places. So this is, this is a, an example of using the value chain not for, for product distribution and sales, but, but for uh, mobilizing finance for small actors. And then 
Um, finally, I wanted to just mention um, the root capital model, which I think is more familiar perhaps to many of you, which is a model which uses purchasing con contracts for um, commodities uh, to secure uh, lending. We know that financial institutions finance only about 10% of pre-harvest financing needs for, for small farmer co cooperatives, uh, and it is a major constraint uh, in terms of their ability to, to grow, to respond to demand for these uh, high-value certified products. So the root capital model basically um, involves um, uh, a link between root capital as the social investment fund, which provides training to the farmer associations uh, to improve the quality of their products and to expand volume, the farmer associations then provide their purchase contracts to root capital to secure loans from root capital to those farmer associations. And the purchase contracts come from um, coffee producers, for example, uh, Starbucks, Sustainable Harvest, Green Mountain. So the purchase contracts are securing these loans and enabling root capital to finance and train an ever larger volume of, um, of farmers. So this is an example of value chain finance which can work in the ag agricultural sector as well. So to close, um, to summarize, basically, uh, we, we have seen a, a pretty dramatic evolution in efforts to empower small firms and link them to value chains. We are now much more focused on um, including them in the value chains of anchor firms rather than engaging them individually or establishing horizontal connections between them. Um, the companies that are driving these value chains are large companies. They're driven by very much business considerations as well as CSR. Cost considerations, sustainability considerations, rising commodity de demand and rising demand from socially mobile populations. Um, and so um, to respond to those, um, those drivers, uh, development institutions can support things like increased competitiveness, a focus on branding and certification, getting small actors involved in distribution, in product innovation, in social business models, and in building uh, value chain finance models. So, and the role of an organization like ours is to take the initial risk, to innovate, to uh, take the prime mover risk, to use grants to solve some of the information and skill problems, um, and to, and most difficult and perhaps most significant is to convene the right actors and bring them together. And as you've seen in all of those schematics, there are multiple actors that have to be brought together to solve the coll collective action problems. And then finally, what we really need to do is develop metrics to see whether we're actually raising the incomes of the small actors that we're reaching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, uh, I'd like to invite our uh, first uh, group of panelists up to the uh, to the front of the stage. My name is Scott Miller. I'm the Scholl Chair in International Business here at CSIS. I run the International Business Program. I'm pleased to be working with the U.S. Leadership and Development uh, pr Project on uh, this uh, this initiative. We're going to shift now to uh, a broader discussion. on the rise of global value chains and, and what it means from a policy standpoint. Global value chains have uh, radically influenced the patterns of trade and the way things are made in the world. Uh, like any other major economic change, it's a multiple factors involved. The principal one is technology. And anybody who's lived in the last 25 years and has been sentient would recognize that, uh, that there have been massive changes in uh, information, communications, and transport technology. <coughs> What uh, this has done is lowered the barriers to the transmission of goods, services, people, ideas, and uh, culture. 
it's often called globalization. It's a technologically driven factor. It's a, a better way of doing things. And in, indeed, some of the key researchers, like Richard Baldwin, call it globalization 2.0. 1.0 was the Industrial Revolution. That's how different this is now. Uh, there, there have also been policy changes that have helped globalization or helped this process of global value chains emerge. Most importantly, the opening of China, the fall of uh, the Soviet communism and central planning broadly, and the opening of markets uh, broadly uh, through the last 20 years uh, through uh, lowering of tariff barriers. Commercially, most firms approach this new set of uh, opportunities as a way to specialize and improve their business. Specialization is not new. In fact, Adam, in, 18, in 1776, Adam Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, wrote that the degree of specialization is only limited by the size of the market. As the market gets bigger, specialization increases, and firms are able to specialize in their piece of the value chain that makes the most sense. So today's program from here on will be a deeper dive into uh, the global value chains how and how developing economies can benefit from these global value chains. The first panel will be the policy backdrop. Then we'll have a presentation on some uh, exciting new research of how how we measure trade and how basically the way we've been measuring trade for the last 50 years doesn't make sense. There are new ways. We'll present those new ways. And the second panel will then come and talk about how developing economies actually operationalize uh, life in global value chains to succeed. I'm delighted to welcome the first panel today to provide the policy backdrop. Uh, the first speaker will be Ted Moran. Ted is uh, the Marcus Wallenberg Chair in International Business and Finance at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and is simply the, the most knowledgeable person in Washington on issues of foreign direct investment and development. He's written about it for years. Thank you. I, I hope you got that on tape. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll send a copy to your family. <laughs> Do you want me to use, you can hear me with this, yeah. Yes. Nancy Lee's presentation was so marvelous that I'm hoping I can live up to the same level. Did you have that on tape? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, do I? How do I move this? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I'm going to begin with a point that all of us in this room will agree uh, will agree with, and that is we will all raise to talk about trade. And today we have to shift what we think about and talk about trade and investment. Um, because multinational corporations account for 80% of all cross-border flows, 80% of all cross-border flows, either within their inter-affiliate transactions or as part of their supply chains. Now, um, I am going to, I am very interested, both from an academic point of view and from a uh, sustainability point of view, in the universe that Nancy was talking about. But my space is broader in the sense that we often think that uh, low-skilled activities are the primary uh, assembly operations that multinational corporations have in developing markets, garments, footwear, and then the kind of agricultural supply chains and other supply chains. But in fact, the bulk of all supply chains are not in lowest skilled activities, but in medium skilled activities. So transportation equipment, that means auto parts, industrial machinery, electronics, electrical products, scientific <laughs> instruments, medical devices. Well, I laid this out, and um, this is 14 times larger my students come and say, well, multinational corporations go to the developing countries to take advantage of cheap labor. Well, relatively cheap labor, but these are actually middle class and lower middle class jobs that make up the bulk of supply chains. And the area that I'm interested in is a, a little bit different. Building industrial clusters and uh, export zones, but industrial export zones 
uh, for all of these kinds of products. And um, I mean, my own work besides my research uh, right now happens to be in Morocco, in Tangier, building an export hub right across from the EU for when the EU returns to business. Uh, <laughs> And also in uh, South Africa. I mean, that just happens to be where I'm working. But this is a kind of a, this is a clustering phenomenon and a uh, supply chain into the mainline operations of multinationals. That is my universe that I'm talking about. Now, this is supposed to be out about policy, and the biggest policy debate surrounding these type of supply chains is the runaway plant debate. Does outward investment by U.S. firms substitute for job creation and investment at home or complement it? And here, with Scott's permission, I am um, going to report on some new work that was done at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I am not touting my own horn. I mean, I, I and Gary Huffbauer wrote the book, but Lindsay Oldensky, a brilliant econometrician, uh, did, the, did the heavy lifting. And we looked at the substitute or complement debate and found out that an increase in FDI by a U.S. manufacturing firm is associated with an increase in domestic activity. So this is a complementary phenomenon. I'll come to the policy implications in a minute. So our results show that if a U.S. firm increases employment at foreign affiliates by 10%, Domestic employment goes up by 4%. Not in every case. I mean, there are runaway plants. We all know cases of that. But the overall phenomenon is a complementary phenomenon. And capital expenditures go up at the same time. A new finding has to do with the globalization of R&D, which is here in Washington very worrisome. Oh, what happens when we build campuses in China or in India or in Eastern Europe, and what you find is that when a U.S. MNC increases R&D abroad, it actually expands its R&D at home. And an odd finding is that firms that don't engage in overseas R&D don't tend to do so much uh, R&D at home too. So this is a very strong complementary effect. And um, <clears throat> talking about contemporary debate about tax policy and tax policy toward multinational corporations. The policy implication of these findings is that if our beloved Congress uh, t takes measures to uh, make it more difficult or to penalize MNCs for moving abroad, it will weaken job creation, investment, R&D, and exports at home rather than strengthening it. Now, I invite you to take a look at the analysis because I know this is not what you hear most of the time wandering around uh, the streets of Washington. Now, I'd like to, um, so MNC supply chains, even in this middle level auto parts, industrial parts, uh, pharmaceutical, medical devices, chemicals, petrochemicals, this realm of activity are not threatening to the U.S. home economy. Incidentally, we didn't do this for Europe or Japan, but there, is comp there are complementary econometric studies that have been done so that this is not unique to the United States. You, you, you find this in other industrial countries. So I want to conclude with the policy looking from the point of view of the host government or multilateral institutions. What can be done to foster supply chains in developing countries? It's a minute and a half, no more than that. But, um, well, first of all is the old view. How do you foster supply chains, well, you impose performance requirements on the MNCs. You make them do domestic content, you make them do JVs, you impose technology transfer requirements. That's the old view. Why did I call it the old view? This is China's view. So, I, I mean, I, 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 th th there, there is a lot of this still going on saying this is the way to build supply chains. The new evidence that we've reviewed is you begin with 
improve doing business indicators because local suppliers need good business climate just like foreign investors or anybody else. You can't treat them miserably or uh, have huge amounts of red tape and corruption and then expect that you're going to see them uh, flourish. Access to imported goods. This is a new we all think imports are good for consumers. Increasingly we know that imports are good for the competitiveness of firms because depending on the industry, 60, 70, 80 percent of the imports are intermediates, are inputs that help make the firms more competitive. So we don't have to just go around telling our students, you know, don't beat up on imports, but uh, you know, it, it is a step toward the competitiveness of the local suppliers and then programs as Nancy was talking about, certification for efficiency and quality control. Um, I think the evidence indicates that the three principal areas where, uh, where external assistance is needed is to help with competent investment promotion agencies. Trying to get middle skilled multinationals to move into Tangiers in Morocco or to move into South Africa, I mean the two cases that I'm looking at, it, 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 it's hard to do. I mean, and you have to figure out how, and it's not just piling up tax breaks and subsidies. I mean, it's really, well, so good investment promotion agencies and then a big role for public-private partnerships for vocational skill building. So that when they come to Morocco or South Africa or the Philippines, um, they, they can partner with vocational institutions on the ground to get the kind of managers and supervisors and workers uh, that they need. And then infrastructure clusters with industrial parks or agro-processing facilities. I think this is also true for, for uh, the kinds of things Nancy were talking about, but for industrial centers and industrial parks, it's particularly clear, the infrastructure. Um, I'm done. Just let markets work is not enough. Just improve doing business indicators is not enough. You can't just say this will happen on its own. Supply chain development in industrial countries requires light-handed support. I'm not talking about big industrial policy, you know, Chinese type uh, sectors and, and requirements, but light-handed support by developed countries, multilateral financial institutions, and developing country agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Extraordinary overview in a short period of time. We appreciate that. Uh, the next speaker is Juan Blyde. Uh, Juan is senior economist at the Inter-American Development Bank, and he's leading a very exciting uh, major research program on how developing economies can improve their policies and in improve their success with global value chains. Juan? All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to start by thanking Scott for the kind invitation to come to to this um, excellent uh, conference to talk about this uh, interesting topic. Uh, uh, as just Scott said, uh, we are the Inter-American Development Bank, in particular in the integration and trade sector. We are doing. Uh, we've been doing some research uh, for the last three years uh, on how Latin American countries are uh, uh, inserted in this global value chain. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is just to share, you know, very, uh, some of the findings that we have here. Uh, so, from, so you will have a, pers a perspective from the point of view of the developing country of what are the challenges the firms in these countries face to, to access this value change and, um, and what are some of the policies that countries are implemented, which in many ways are going to be complemented to what, what, what you saw from uh, Nancy's great presentation. So, so one of the first things that we wanted to do is just to measure how much countries in Latin America are participating in, in, in this value chain. So, so we look at FDI data, which is you know, the topic of this panel, and uh, specifically on Don and Bradstreet data sets. So we look at the multilaterals around the world and the subsidiaries of those multilaterals that are vertically linked to them, meaning a subsidiary or affiliate that uh, produce an input or a component to that parent company. So let me uh, show you like a, a, a picture of that data set. 
uh, in the uh, circles you see the multinationals in the world. The, the, the no, I mean, the, the bigger the circle is, the the, the more parent companies, the more multinationals the country has. Uh, so here is no surprise, uh, the United States, the uh, country in the world that has more multinationals in the world, followed by Germany in, uh, in Europe, and uh, you have Japan, the third con uh, country. Um, so then uh, the lines represent where are the, the, uh, the affiliates of those parent companies in, in each of the countries. So for example, you can see that the United States has a lot of uh, affiliates in Canada, for example, or the UK. Uh, you can see in Asia, for example, Hong Kong has a lot of affiliates or subsidiaries in China, uh, Japan also. But I would like you to focus the attention on Latin America. I mean, it's the same with Africa. You know, this is really, they, uh, they are really playing a marginal role in this uh, fragmentation of production between parent companies and, and, and affiliates. So you can say, well, what happened is that the Latin American countries are small countries, so they don't have the capacity to host that many uh, affiliates of multinational companies. In that sense, that's true. Uh, you can see that in this graph. This is the same data presented in a different way. Uh, on the vertical axis, you have the number of, multilateral, um, uh, of vertical subsidiaries that are link, vertically linked to uh, the parent uh, on, of the country. And then uh, you, on the horizontal axis, you have the GDP of the country. So you see it's a positive relationship. The countries that are bigger host more uh, subsidiaries uh, uh, from multinational companies. But as you can see, the red dots are the countries in Latin America, and they seem to be almost all of them below the trend line, meaning that uh, Latin American countries seem to uh, have less vertical subsidiaries than what you should expect given their si economic size. So this is one of the many indicators that we have. Of course, Latin America is not a monolithic region. I mean, there are, you know, Mexico seems to be right according to this measure. But in, on average, that seems to be the case, which is to support the general perception that people have that Latin American countries seems to be uh, less engaged in global supply chains than other regions like Asia and stuff. So then the question obvious is, why? So we look at several different issues. I'm going to uh, show you one of them, which is the role of transport and logistics infrastructure. So here is the same data, and we divided the countries in four groups. The group four is the countries with the best quality of logistic infrastructure in the world. Group one is the countries with the lowest quality of logistic infrastructure. And as you can see, there is a positive relationship. Uh, the, the, the group four countries hold more than 70% of all the subsidiaries that are vertically linked to their parent companies. Well, the group one only holds less than 1%. So there is obviously a positive relationship between the quality of logistic infrastructure uh, and, and the capacity to hold subsidiaries that are linked in a value change to the parent company. Uh, so what we did is a little bit more sophisticated econometric analysis to try to isolate the role of transport and logistic infrastructure uh, from other factors. And then we ask a simple question and we simulate what will be, how much will increase the number of vertically subsidiaries that I host if I increase the quality of the logistic infrastructure in my country to the average level that we observe in the EU. Uh, in the EU. And uh, that, um, but I, by quality of logistic infrastructure, I'm, I'm talking about the quality of airport infrastructure, uh, the quality of port infrastructure, and the quality of ICT, which is information and communication technology. And this is the result what we got. Um, it's pretty amazing. It's around 15% for the average of Latin America, which we think is very high. And of course, for some countries like Haiti and Paraguay, which have a larger gap in terms of the quality of the logistic infrastructure with the EU, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the increase will be higher. So this, you know, at the outset, it will tell you that you know, there is a lot of homework that Latin American countries definitely has to do in this particular area of transport and logistic infrastructure. I can talk for hours about this. We can probably, but I don't have the time. We can, we can do it uh, on, on, on the Q&A session if you want. I just want to mention briefly uh, something else that I think is very important and comes out of this uh, project. Uh, and, and Nancy also mentioned it a little bit, uh, is, uh, well, a lot, uh, is the issue about information and coordination failures. And that came uh, through a, a, some uh, case studies that we run that, uh, for this particular project. You can have the best ports, you can have the best airports, but still there are a lot of companies that are not going to be able to uh, 
to be inserted in this global supply chain because they need the right skill and capabilities to do so. Uh, we saw that the typical firm that is inserted in a, in a value chain has uh, the capabilities are way higher than the ones that are just serving the domestic market. That's typically the case. Now, investing capabilities is mostly a firm's choice, but sometimes that can be hindered by information problems, by coordination problems. I might not know precisely what are the capabilities that I need in order to sell to Walmart uh, uh, because you know I'm not selling a commodity so the price information is not enough you know the buyer might not have enough information to know if you are you know reliable you have a good quality uh, because exactly it's exactly the same thing you are not selling a commodity the price information is not enough so this match might not take place so let me tell you, and with this I will finish, some of the uh, pro things that governments are doing around uh, Latin America to address this type of uh, uh, problems. And, and let me talk about Costa Rica, um, Costa Rica Prove. Uh, and this will allow, it's just one example, but this will allow me to talk about some of the things that you know, governments in the region are doing and it will also allow me to tell you what is missing from this thing. So Costa Rica Prove is a program that is run by the Trade Promotion Organization of Costa Rica, which is called Procomer, and it's based on the matchmaking services between the multinationals that are located in Costa, in Costa Rica and the local suppliers, potential local suppliers there. So basically what it does is just they, they uh, address the needs of the multinational in terms of what are the inputs, uh, components, and raw materials that they need. And so then they try to do the match with the local suppliers that, you know, that they can comply with these requirements that the multinational companies pose. Now, as you can see in this graph, this program has been successful. Uh, these are the number of linkages between local suppliers and the multinationals in Costa Rica. and has been growing since the program started in 2002. And the total sales also has been increasing. However, uh, uh, an independent uh, uh, study evaluation of this program that took place recently said that it was a very good first step, but the scope is still limited for you know, these reasons. That's what it says. The size of the program is relatively small. I mean, we're talking about only $300,000 for five years. So you, it's not a lot you can do with, with that money. So it's almost, almost surprising that you see these effects with this amount of money. They only provide matching services. So they're only addressing the information failure, the information problem, and not many other problems, like for example, Nancy was mentioning, like financing, the needs for financing, the needs for, needs for training. And they, you know, they did not coordinate with other programs that exist in Costa Rica that precisely uh, address all the uh, issues. So the government is now uh, uh, rethinking the program, is trying to coordinate with other programs in order to try to, uh, to have synergy by combina combining uh, different programs so these programs will be more helpful. Uh, this actually has been the experience in other countries like uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, etc. So I will finish here. I just want to say uh, that this uh, re the research uh, is going to be ready probably by the beginning of next year. Uh, of course, you're going to be able to, to download uh, this, this report free. And uh, uh, it will include these things and many other things that you know, I don't have a chance to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, the wonderful example of uh, in Costa Rica, the pointed out by Juan, of exactly what Ted was talking about with this soft support from the government. There's a role. It also reminded me of the, Juan's point about know-how. It's not just building good ports. As Richard Baldwin says, know-how is the cause, trade is the effect. <laughs> if you want trade, you've got to have the know-how. And it's this knowledge and connection that is now possible because of communication technology, but is essential because of uh, segmentation and fragmentation. Uh, in any case, uh, thank you, Juan. I really appreciate that. Let me introduce our third uh, panelist. Clay Lowry is Vice President of Rock Creek Global Advisors. Clay was Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs and brings a wealth of experience both in managing U.S. and in trade and investment policy from the Treasury Department and also his role in private practice advising U.S. clients. Clay? Thank you, Scott, um, and thanks for having me here. I'm going to talk a little quick because I had actually planned for a 10-minute presentation. Um, so I was trying to think of what I could do to help you guys out a little bit and from an audience perspective. Uh, Ted is an expert. Juan has done some amazing research. Nancy's working in the field forever. By the way, I worked with Nancy for over 15 years, so I'm very happy to be following her. So I thought I could provide the comedic 
the comedic approach to this whole thing. My wife then said to me, what are you talking about? And I said, oh, uh, global value supply chains. And she's like, there's no comedy good enough for them. <laughs> um, so, um, so the timing of this conference is actually excellent for two aspects from a US perspective. First is this is a week in which you're seeing a lot more activity regarding TPP, the tra uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which will get you into a lot of value chain type of ideas, rules of origin, et cetera. Um, there, you're seeing people starting to advocate on behalf of that agreement. Obviously, there's an attempt to try to get it done by the end of the year, which may be a little ambitious, but I think that the, the timing is very good. The second aspect is just this week, the U.S. government is holding a very large conference on foreign direct investment into the United States. How do we attract it? This is probably a harder sale than it used to be. Just look at what's been happening over the last month with all the political shenanigans about just our budget. And also, frankly, the rollout of Obamacare, so to speak, um, because it just kind of shows a little bit of, um, well, frankly, some incompetence on, on how the government actually operates. So probably not the greatest time for that, but it's probably a very good thing that the Obama administration is trying to lead that es effort. So what I thought I would do, at least, is just kind of, you've heard about some of the statistics, you've heard about some of the field studies and some of the research, um, I just want to hit on a couple points on where I think that it could actually affect broader policy thinking from hopefully, in my opinion, from politicians on Capitol Hill and the executive branch and also some uh, policy makers themselves. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is like if you look at, uh, there's an OECD WTO study that basically says that roughly 30 to 60 percent of all G20 exports consist of intermediate imports, 30 to 60 percent. And their growth has been around, from the growth of intermediate exports has been about 30 to 40 percent over the last 15 years. That's incredible. So that means that basically we're thinking about like when we export something or when we import something and we say it's a U.S. good or a Chinese good or a Japanese good, that's really not as true as it used to be. And so w what could that mean from a perspective on how we look at at the world. All right, so let me take you back a little bit. In the late 1990s, when I was working for uh, Hank Paulson at Treasury, we came under a lot of strain from Congress, but not just Congress, from other people as well, about our bilateral trade deficit with China and how that um, we had think tanks, very well-known think tanks in this town saying China, China is a manipulator, look at the bilateral trade deficit. I, I'm not sure if they'd remember their economics, bilateral trade deficits don't mean that much, but that's how basically people thought of it. All right, so I recall we and a guy named Bob Doner at the Treasury Department found a study that uh, had been done at Stanford that basically said in 2006 that if you looked at the value added bilateral trade deficit with China as opposed to the, uh, the actual nominal one, it would be cut by 80 percentage points. 80 percentage points. Okay, that suggests that instead of having a $200 billion bilateral trade deficit at the time, we really had probably one that was closer to $40 billion if you looked at value added content. That actually is a significant change and it actually hopefully would significantly change how people thought of what was happening and how to make policy. So <clears throat> what I wanted to suggest is that um, that Stanford study though was unique. Nobody could find it. I didn't know where it was. Bob found it. Um, now we have the WTO and the OECD basically trying to put together a comprehensive and analytical pro uh, perspective on all of these issues. Um, and they actually just did a report to the G20 just um, about a month ago. They're still working on these issues. I think that if we could actually finally find ways to get this forward, make it more public, whether it's through the Peterson Institute, CSIS, and others, that maybe politicians can start thinking about this and we can create a little more sobriety in our thinking. Um, Look, it's, it's, it's hard for us to jump for, it's easy to look at a nominal trade deficit or, or what does the currency look like. But I think that if you provide real facts and real figures to people, maybe uh, politicians and even like policy economists can kind of overcome some of these, let's try to get a headline and instead let's try to actually find a better way of doing policy. A second aspect of this that I was thinking about um, 
this is where I skip forward a little bit, is um, I was looking at how do businesses think about value supply chains. Um, so Jim Owens, the former CEO of Caterpillar, supposedly said, well, he did say, uh, the, com <laughs> the, the competitor that best manages their supply chain is probably going to be the most successful competitor over time. And this was part of a McKinsey study. Um, and McKinsey basically did a study on how do firms react to global supply chains. And they said that the key aspect is that they are splintering up the monolithic supply chains that we've had in our past into smaller, more flexible ones that adapt to the complexity of the services and can, still can, can provide uh, customers their service. So this actually, what does this mean for policymakers? Um, policymakers, let's be honest, have a tendency to try to find ways, how can we grab pieces of the global supply chain and hold on to them and not let them go? If the McKenzie study is correct, it suggests that basically that won't work very well because uh, companies are finding more nimble ways to get around supply chain aspects. So when you hear about local content requirements, which Ted's done a lot of work on, uh, this actually suggests that maybe this won't work. So let me give you a, an example that is in the headlines right now. And that is basically, how do we process data? So um, if you look in Brazil, if you look in Europe, and if you look in India and China, you hear about uh, countries partially because of the fallout from Edward Snowden, partially because of their own, as I said, ability to try to grab part of the value chain. One of the ideas that people have is let's create a, we must put a, 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 cl a cloud that is based just in Brazil or just in, uh, just in uh, Europe. So in other words, you must have your, um, um, I just forgot the name of it, um, you must have, yeah, servers, thank you, you must have your servers actually located in that, that country. Now, one, I don't think that that really will work, but the reason supposedly is, is so we can't, so the NSA can't go and look and listen to things. Does, does anybody really think that's going to uh, stop the NSA? <laughs> um, so maybe a better solution is, one, let intelligence agencies deal with each other and have a real discussion, and that probably needs to happen. Second, Maybe we, what we uh, need to do, on if there are problems with data privacy and you're worried about what Facebook is doing or Google or whoever, deal with them and, have, and find out what is the right type of regulatory environment uh, for that. And third, on supply, but don't try to basically put a bunch of servers and try to cut the cord, so to speak, because all that's going to do is it's going to, you know, yes, it'll probably harm Facebook and Google's business, but it's also going to help harm all your global supply chains that basically rely on very, uh, very sophisticated global servers in order to get things done, as well as the local suppliers who are the people that they're trying to get products from. Um, and by the way, I was very happy to see an old boss of mine, Mike Froman, saying just yesterday um, that that is an intent of the United States in the TPP to try to actually have cross-border flows as part of a trade agreement. So those are the kind of two big things I was I thought about, which is one, um, we need to watch our protectionism, and two, maybe what we need to do this if we can continue to figure out more and more information about global supply chains, maybe that will help us um, avoid some of our uh, sillier policy instincts. Um, I did have a couple specific points that I thought were worth pointing out. One, again, from the study is the rise of services and how important services are. And it doesn't get almost any play in this country, which is if you look at services, it is 50% of US exports, 50% um, are made up of services. Now, that's not service trade. That's basically services as part of manufactured exports, services as part of other types of exports. Um, and um, instead of, when we look at that, we never think about how do we think about getting better access for our services industries, or at least it seems rare. L let me provide you a, an easy example, XM Bank. So the United States Export Import Bank basically says you must have 85% of your content manufactured in the United States. Okay, if you actually look around the world right now, um, 
in all exports, the average for exports is 70%. So that's basically, they're already well above that. The United States is around somewhere about 75% of their exports is manufactured in the United States. If you look at other export credit agencies, remember XM Bank says that it's in business to basically compete with other export credit agencies. Their levels are 50% and below. There's nobody above 50% besides the United States at 85%. All right, so that's how you try to look at manufactured exports. If you look at services, basically XM Bank can almost not do business with service providers that are doing, trying to export their goods. So I think that instead of basically the administration bragging about how they're providing a billion dollars back to the Treasury through all the work they're doing at XM Bank, or the uh, opponents of XM Bank complaining about crony capitalism, maybe the better idea is to try to actually find, are there some solutions where we can actually modernize that, uh, that bank and actually help our own pro uh, providers? One other issue that I wanted to mention, which is kind of a weird one, um, or XM sort of weird, I guess, but is a different one, is, is trade finance. All right, so trade finance is a very big issue in Latin America and elsewhere. It is a way of basically, if you think about it, if your global supply chains breaks up more and more and more, trade finance becomes slightly riskier because you have to go, and go to smaller and smaller uh, institutions and, f and figure out ways to finance them. Now, trade finance, by large, is not a very big money-making business. It's kind of have very low margins uh, business. In the Basel Capital Accords that just have happened um, over the last few years, we've basically taken, we've made the capital charge you must take for taking any trade finance opportunity and raised it. What is that going to do? It is going to probably have an effect over time on trade finance because it is a low margin business. And so it will suggest if you're a financial institution, why take a risk on that when I have to have this type of capital when I can do it on other things? So that's kind of the types of things um, I see when I see global supply chains. And kind of, I think it goes back to the points that everybody's made so far, which is you have to think about how is this affecting you as a policymaker and sometimes it might be a little thing like the trade finance uh, type of issues, or it may be something big, which is there's got to be a better way than some of the protectionist measures we try to come up with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clay, and thanks, thanks to the whole panel. We now have, uh, as my grandfather would have said, we've dumped a lot of hay on the horses this morning, uh, and uh, there's a lot of content, and uh, I'm going to open the, the floor for questions uh, for a few minutes. We look forward to it, uh, and if I could impose on Nancy, who's still here, if you have a question for Nancy, uh, she just nodded her head, so she'll be available as well. Um, three rules for questions. First, wait for the microphone. Mm -hmm. well, we, have a, we have a large online audience, and this is, uh, the webcast is being recorded. So we, they won't hear who you are and the, or your question until you speak into the microphone. Second, start with your name and organization. And third, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, which is make sure your question is in the form of a question. Uh, with that, uh, I'll open it up. Yes, sir. Hi, Tony Carroll of Manchester Trade. I'm also a senior associate here at the Africa program. And Nancy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, I think the figure now is close to uh, $90 billion in what used to be called diaspora or now including crowdfunding coming into the developing world. And a lot of that is striving to find um, coherence and relevance. And I'm wondering whether or not some of this sort of repatriated investment from the diaspora communities cannot find a way into being used in creative financing for global value chains. Uh, you're talking about your root capital. I'm wondering whether or not the, this might be um, a vehicle in which some of that funding could be both provide attractive returns, uh, but also provide value in providing you know, capital in areas that major financial institutions just don't yet know how to manage it? Uh, that's a great question um, and, and, and raises a channel for finance that, um, that can be a very powerful channel. It has been a powerful channel for individual countries for a long time. Um, countries like Haiti, countries like Armenia, um, where there's a substantial part of the population is outside the country. Those financial flows in terms of remittances, investment, um, are very large in relation to the size of economies. But as you point out, now we have platforms to intermediate that finance that we did not have before. We, we no longer have to, to rely simply on financial institutions that have branches 
um, in, the, in the recipient country. So um, let me just mention two different kinds of examples of, of the power of that, of that flow. Um, one is in Haiti, you know, which I, I think remittances account for some, uh, nearly 20% of the Haitian economy, or they're, they're one-fifth of the size of the Haitian economy. Um, so they're big. Um, but they, they normally come in the form of cash. Basically, there are transfers either for money transfer organizations or in some cases through uh, financial institutions and you basically, the recipient pulls out the cash. Um, we have experimented with a project in which we have created a platform um, so that the remittance sender can buy something in the, well, purchase something uh, in a contract in the United States and have it delivered to the family in Haiti. And the particular thing, the particular platform, um, is run by an organization called Arc Finance and it is uh, selling solar lanterns and ultimately, we hope, cook stoves, um, environmentally sustainable cook stoves. So the idea is you're, you're in New York, you have a relative in Haiti, you purchase the solar lantern. The solar lantern is either delivered to the family in Haiti or the family has a local distribution point. So it's sort of like the Amazon.com of, or of uh, lanterns. And what we found, so we, we were, you know, the question, the hypothesis was that if you provided this, um, this useful product, the remittance provider would be motivated to um, purchase it rather than send cash. But you know, you could have argued the other way, the remittance provider doesn't actually really want to control what happens with the cash, they just want to send the cash. Turns out it's very attractive to the remittance sender. So, um, so the, it just, the whole market exploded very quickly. Um, uh, and in fact, um, uh, is now going to be replicated in other parts of the world, in Africa in, in particular. So, um, so you can use those, um, uh, those platforms to um, sort of accomplish several objectives, to transmit value, to uh, give people in poor countries access to products that they otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't um, be able to purchase. Then let me just mention a totally different example. This is really kind of a... Um, a all right, very, very quickly. Um, Japan. Japan has diaspora in Peru. Um, there is a crowdfunding platform in Japan in, Japan in which J uh, ordinary Japanese want to fund um, Japanese descent farmers in Peru and they're using this crowdfunding platform and it's quite large. So, um, so the, these crowdfunding channels can be powerful to connect um, diaspora with home country um, individuals. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, sir. My name is Daniel Hernandez, representing USAID. This question is also for Nancy Lee. I was just wondering, in the presentation, you had, on, you had mentioned um, CSR. I wasn't sure what that meant, if you could explain what that is. And then I was also curious, I had seen before there was an organization called the Unkai Foundation, which is also what helps to empower like Peruvian youth um, in regards to education. And I saw like IDB works with it. So I was wondering if they also utilize the social business model. Okay, thanks. So very uh, briefly, CSR is corporate social responsibility and it was the, it's the traditional reasons that large corporations do things wi with have, which have social value. So I was just trying to make the point that that's still, that's still a significant motivator, but their own business models are now providing an increasingly powerful motivator for these kinds of high social value activities. And um, the organization uh, that you're referring to, uh, wha one thing I didn't talk about was the, value, the labor part of the value chain, um, which is also a powerful motivator for corporations that have difficulty in attracting uh, s skilled people She's for entry stuck. level jobs. So that's another big area that we're working, we and other development organizations, USAID certainly are working in, in terms of partnering with corporations to train um, uh, it, you know, young people for entry level jobs, not just for their own uh, hirees, but for, um, for, you know, a, a wide variety of entry-level jobs. 
Thank you. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists and Nancy for their contribution. <laughs> We're now going to go where no CSIS program has gone before. <laughs> I mean that literally. Uh, we're in our new building. One of the things I've learned about uh, construction is that the contract for the audiovisual support began after the construction contract was completed. So uh, we are welcoming via uh, video link uh, Mr. Dirk Pilot. Uh, Dr. Pilot is uh, leading a uh, major project at the OECD. He's the head of the Structural Policy Division, the Director of Science, Technology, and Industry, has been at the OECD for 20 years and is leading groundbreaking work on how to measure the, the added value of global value chains. This is work that uh, it actually builds directly off comments that Clay Lowry made uh, in his remarks about politicians reacting to the wrong data. If we can get politicians to think about the ways Dirk is actually measuring the way the real world operates instead of complaining about bilateral trade deficits, we'll move the debate forward and we'll, we'll have a better policy environment. So we're, we're hoping to have Dirk appear on the screen and uh, make this presentation. And uh, let me stop talking and see if Dirk is there. This is what's known in the business as performing without a net. That, uh, Dirk, I think we just heard you. We, you can hear me now. Well, you now. Now you're coming through loud and clear. Thank you and thank welcome. You. Thanks for great, doing this. Great. Scott, uh, thank you for the introduction. Sorry for the technicalities. Uh, Paul uh, Nadeau and I have really tried to make this work for a little while. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'll try to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what the OECD is doing on this topic. Um, you've introduced me as leading this work, uh, but this is something which we are trying to do across uh, the OECD with uh, quite a number of uh, big team. Uh, we're also very very closely with the WTO, and I was uh, listening into your discussion earlier on where you already uh, touched on some of the things which we're trying to do. Uh, the idea is really to try and get a better handle on these, uh, these global value chains. So. Uh, uh, let me not uh, take uh, too much introduction. Um, I just, just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do. Um, and this is what we've called measuring trade and value added. And I'll explain that a little bit uh, in a second. Um, we also wanted to talk then a little bit how we see, we see different countries which we are currently covering in our database uh, being uh, positioned in these global value chains. Uh, I then want to talk a little bit how you can benefit from global value chains and, and make the link a little bit to development and then uh, perhaps in the end touch on a couple of policy issues which uh, were raised also by in your discussion already. Um, so I think you're all familiar with what global value chains are so I don't want to dwell too much on that. Uh, we have this seen this big growth of these international production networks uh, with a lot of intra-industry trade happening in them. Uh, a lot of this involves multinational enterprises which also do uh, activities within uh, their own networks. Uh, we've seen uh, probably much more specialized and complex production relationships evolving in these, uh, in these sectors where uh, certain stages of, of production are undertaken in, in, in activities in certain countries and other parts in another country and you get assembly uh, then happening again in, in other countries. Um, just to give you a few examples, these are a couple of case studies which uh, we've just, just put together. I mean, there are many from very simple things like uh, the production of a t-shirt in, in involving uh, cotton and uh, production and perhaps in, 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 in China, uh, more complex products like a Barbie doll, which is actually uh, more complex than you might think, uh, two cars, the Dreamliner or an iPhone, um, all of them which uh, involve many components which have to be put together from, from across the world. Now, 
case studies are interesting, but the problem is a little bit that it's hard to really draw general lessons from them. And what we've tried to do is move a little bit beyond these case studies by really trying to measure these global value chains. And the problem which you have is then whenever a good a product uh, crosses a border several times at different stages of processing, that trade statistics will record that product every time. So if you have a component, for instance, which goes into uh, eventually into an, um, an iPhone or an iPad, uh, any time it will cross the border as part of a, an, another component, it will be counted. And that means you get an enormous amount of double counting happening in, in, in trade statistics, um, um, which then really conceals what is really happening in, in international trade. Uh, the other problem we have, and that's one which is a lot harder, that we don't quite know where the income uh, flows which are linked to uh, to the, this, this trade are, are, are going to, but, but that's something we, we, we're not able to deal with yet. But the real issue is that we have this multiple counting going on, and that's what we've been trying to, to work on. So the idea is to, to go then into, uh, and the example here is, is, is uh, the one you're all very familiar with, is, is the iPhone, uh, which has been uh, analyzed in some detail, uh, where you have the assembly taking place in China in, in the Foxconn factories. You have components coming from the United States flowing to China and you have the final goods uh, flowing from China to the United States. And here the example deals with about 10 million units. Now, if you would just look, look at the US and China, you would get a very large negative uh, bilateral trade deficit of, uh, of the US with China uh, for this particular product. However, if you're then starting to look well where are the components actually coming from and who's actually va uh, adding value in the process, you get a very different picture because then you see that countries like uh, well, Germany, Korea, uh, but also Taiwan and, and, and the rest of the world uh, provide uh, lots of components which then uh, are, assemb are assembled in China. And if you then uh, sort of break this, this bilateral trade uh, balance down into who's, who's really generating the value, you get a very different picture. And that's, for instance, where a lot of the deficit will actually shift to Korea because Samsung is making lots of the components for, for, the, uh, for the iPhone. Uh, so that's the, the idea, what we have been trying to do, uh, not just for one product, but really to try and do it for uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of global trade. And the idea is here is that we go from uh, trying to really break down uh, international trade by who's actually value, uh, adding value to, by, by looking at the suppliers, by looking at uh, the, the, the role of different uh, tiers of suppliers in, in, into the whole, whole process. And the way to do that is that, is that you have to break down uh, trade uh, in, in all its different components in terms of who's adding the value. Uh, there, there are four uh, different components and, and uh, what we, we, we do here is relies on a very large uh, input-output table. Uh, an input-output table basically shows the relationships between uh, different industries. Uh, so what is flowing in terms of, of intermediate inputs from one sector of the economy to another and what is feeding into the production process. And what we've done is build an input-output table which currently covers um, 56 countries, uh, 57 countries actually. Uh, we're constantly adding countries. Uh, we're covering about 95% of world GDP at the moment. And what we're trying to do here is break down between what is foreign value added, so what comes really from abroad, and what is domestic value added. And there are four comp and there are different components here. So if you just just take me, let me take a second on this. If you look at domestic value added, there is one part which is basically, if you look at, at, at a sector of the economy like pharmaceuticals, for instance, uh, part of that would be the value added which is generated in that industry, what, what is really in, generated by the pharmaceutical sector. Then all, another part would be uh, components which come and parts and services which come from other domestic industries, for instance, in the United States. So that's the second part, which is indirect domestic value added generated in purely domestic transactions. And there's a, a third part, which is basically all the things which directly come from abroad and which are produced by other countries. So that's foreign value added, which is feeding into uh, the, 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 the production process in your country. And there's a final component, which is the, the most complex one. This is basically things which you're exporting 
uh, which then are processed abroad and then come back to your country. So basically, these are, this is actually things which you've actually produced. This is value added, which has been generated in your country, and that's the final component, which we call indirect domestic value added. Now, uh, I don't want to take you through all the complexities. This is a, uh, is a, is a, is a quite a difficult thing, but what we, we, we're trying to do here is, is build this big input-output table, which we link uh, with very detailed trade statistics, uh, we cover uh, 57 countries, as I said, all the 34 OECD member countries, uh, all the BRICS. Uh, we've worked very closely with uh, with some of the BRICS. Uh, China, for instance, has been very active in this work. Uh, we have nine economies in Southeast Asia. We we, we, we cover 95% of world uh, of GDP, 90% uh, of world trade, and we're constantly trying to to add countries in, in, in the process. For instance, we are currently uh, trying to add uh, Colombia and, and, and Costa Rica. Uh, I'll come back to that in, in, in a second. Now, the things you can start to do uh, with these types of indicators is are, are a couple of things. The, the first thing we can do is actually look at this foreign value added. So we can see uh, how much of the exports of your country are basically uh, built on, on, on value added coming from abroad. Now, this goes from uh, this covers OECD countries. Uh, the latest data we have is for 2009. Um, for the U.S., it's just over 10 percent, uh, very, very relatively small. But of course, this reflects the size of the U.S. economy. Uh, a little bit larger for Japan, but going all the way up to uh, some countries in the OECD, like Korea, uh, where about 40 percent of the exports uh, are basically uh, involve uh, foreign uh, foreign value added. Uh, these are the OECD countries. We can do the same for uh, the emerging economies for which we have data. And there it goes from a very little in a country like Saudi Arabia and also in Russia uh, to a fairly large uh, share in China, about 30 percent uh, in the middle, uh, to uh, almost over 50 percent in a country like Singapore. So uh, a very large share of foreign value added. And that basically means this basically is, is what you need uh, as imports uh, to produce exports in your in your own country, um, so that's I think an an an, an interesting uh, feature of, of of the data which we can we can look at. We can also look uh, more broadly on on how these how countries are really involved in these global value chains. And what we do here is to um, I'll, I'll skip this one is is to uh, look at what we call backward participation and forward participation. Now the backward one is is basically what I showed to you already. This is basically how much of your um, exports are based on imports coming from uh, from somewhere else. So basically, that's basically looking backward in the value chain. Uh, we can also look at forward participation. And this is how your exports actually feed into exports of another country. Um, and uh, you, again, see that some countries uh, play a very large role here, uh, particularly some of the natural resource producers. Uh, in the middle of the, of the chart, you have uh, Norway. Uh, and of course, Norway is not particularly a country which does a lot in terms of value chain. It's not a particularly industrial country, but it is a very large exporter of oil. And that means that uh, a lot of its uh, products will actually feed into uh, exports of other countries. Uh, you see the same happening for Australia, uh, a little bit uh, to, the, to the right of the screen, and also the United States, where the white bars is a, a lot larger than, uh, than the blue bar. Uh, again, we can do the same uh, on this also for emerging economies. And here you, see, you, for instance, see that countries like Russia and also Saudi Arabia have very large white bars, which basically shows that they have, uh, they're not particularly important in global value chains as being uh, product processes of industrial products, but they are pretty important in feeding into uh, value chains uh, further down, down the line. Um, so this is, these are the types of indicators which we can, we can produce uh, with this. We also have this at the industry level. Uh, and, and another point which really comes from the data and, and I think was already mentioned by, by one of the previous speakers I was listening to is that we now see that services are really, really important in these value chains. We still think about uh, services in international trade and perhaps it's 25% or so of total trade. Uh, but there is a lot of value of services which is really embodied in uh, in, in the exports of goods, and uh, and here you can we can we can see this for for different countries. In a country like the UK, uh, on on the left of the chart, almost 60% of the, the value 
uh, in of, of their trade uh, of their exports is basically services uh, so services are becoming more and more important in, in, in trade in terms of uh, and also the quality of services access to services uh, sort of uh, become uh, really important in, in, in terms of thinking in the international trade agenda and that's one of the I think the, the, the things which we've really been, been finding in this uh, in this data uh, and, and, and this is not only the services sector itself uh, if you look in some detail also in manufacturing sectors uh, a lot of the value there nowadays comes from from the services which are being added uh, like uh, distribution services but also financial services business services uh, which are really important and, and I think if you're thinking about lots of manufacturing companies uh, we know nowadays that that a lot of them uh, the value which they're making and, and the way they differentiate their products often have, have to do with the services that they're adding in the in the production process um, so these are a couple of the indicators which we we, 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 uh, we can derive um, I think uh, there are also areas where we we hear particularly from some developing countries we hear concerns that they still feel well we're not actually creating a lot of value and, and an example of this is is, uh, is China uh, where uh, the example of the iPhone already shows that uh, there is a, a disassembly going on uh, where very little uh, value is sometimes being created uh, nationally and uh, what has been done uh, and the Chinese have worked with us on this database is to try and distinguish what is processing trade and what is non-processing trade so processing trade is basically a foreign multinational often coming in an American a European a Japanese a Korean multinational coming in and doing some assembly or processing in China of, of, of components uh, which often means that there is very little uh, very limited uh, value creation in China and you can see that in the chart where uh, the blue bars for processing trade are a lot lower than for no, non-processing trade uh, but what is happening in China at the moment is that you see that this processing trade is also evolving that more uh, value is being created as, as China is, is slowly starting to move up the value chain in many of these sectors um, we also can, can, can look at this with our own data this comes from the work from, from, from Copeman and also the Chinese Academy of Science but we can also look at this with our own data and, and I don't want you to, to go into too much detail here but if you just look at the, 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 the two bars in the middle uh, machinery and electrical equipment where you basically see uh, that a lot of the value which is basically sort of uh, being created in, in, in the machinery and equipment sector and the electrical equipment sector in, in, in Mexico is still foreign, uh, foreign uh, for, uh, is, is really foreign value added uh, and this is very much like uh, the, the, the case in, in of, of the iPhone or the iPad where uh, most of this is assembly which is being done in, in, in Mexico where relatively little value is being added in, in the process um, I think if, if, if a final point from, from our database, and this was mentioned I think also by, by Claire uh, Lowry already, is uh, what it tells us about bilateral trade balances. And uh, China is one example. Uh, another one is, is, is Mexico. Uh, Mexico has um, a very large, uh, 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 also a, a, a sort of the, an issue of, the, of, of a trade balance with, with, with the United States. And here again, it, it really affects uh, the trade balance if you look at it in uh, what we call gross terms or if we look at it in value added terms so if we really make this distinction uh, between uh, trade in, 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 in sort of the, the, the way we normally look at it and if we measure it in true value added terms we get a very different perspective on where the deficit for Mexico uh, is, is, is in this case um, so it's a way of trying to adjust to, 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 to also uh, change a little bit uh, the discussion on, on, on trade and, uh, and, and policies related to, to global value chains. And so let me try to go through a couple of, 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 of policy issues and I'll come back to a few other indicators in a second. Uh, I think the first thing uh, which we've been trying to draw from, from, this, from, from this work is to really say that uh, these, gl these global value chains are really about imports and exports. You really need to uh, have exports to to try and 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 uh, sort of imports to be able to export. So it's not a question of uh, if you have a barriers on import on, on on your imports, you're actually taxing your own exports. So uh, and and particularly also if we know that sometimes components cross many borders, that trade barriers can become really uh, sort of can add up. So uh, a component which 
is, is, is uh, being affected by lots of trade barriers over time, it will actually become more and more expensive as, as a component in, in, into the global value chain. Um, the third part here is, is that a, a lot of this is also about uh, sort of uh, trade facilitation and efficient services. The way these global value chains work, uh, you really have to make sure that they are efficient. Uh, firms are really thinking very hard about how much time does it take, how, much, how, much, uh, how costly is it to, uh, to outsource certain parts of certain countries. So uh, making it easier to trade and make it efficient to, to sort of trade across borders and be involved in these value chains is, is really important. Um, I think a, a, a final part here is that, that, of course, it's not only about trade because a lot of what's happening here is, uh, is also linked to investment. It has to do with uh, the role of multinational companies, uh, so how easy it is to sort of bring come into uh, to different markets to, to, to enter certain markets and to do, do business there. Uh, so what we are starting to see a little bit is that a lot of discussion also now in, in, in bilateral and regional uh, trade ag agreements, of course, is much broader than uh, only trade and, and, and needs to uh, cover uh, far more things than, than, than just trade uh, to, to really uh, work out. Um, other point, I think, is, is when we're looking a little bit more also in, in what it implies for competitiveness of countries, uh, we sometimes now say that what you do matters more than what you sell. And what I mean with that is what you do means, well, what exactly are you doing in a value chain? What is the acti activity you're involved in? What's the stage which you're involved in rather than what you sell? Because uh, in, in a sense, uh, China uh, may be seen as selling uh, sort of the iPad or being the final assembler, uh, but that is not really what is uh, the most uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the stage of, of the process which, where a lot of the value is being created. So you need to look very carefully, I think, as a company, and of course governments have some interest in this as well, in terms of what actually are you, are you involved in and, and what are your strengths and weaknesses. Um, I already made a point that, that it really depends on exports and imports, that uh, we still have a little bit sometimes a mindset of that, that exports are goods and imports are bad. Uh, I think it's very clear that you need them both, uh, and also it means that sometimes you need to outsource uh, things as well. Um, I mentioned already manufacturing. Uh, I think uh, we still see that manufacturing is still uh, the main channel through which a lot of uh, trade happens in global value chains. Uh, but a lot of it now really the value creation is more and more linked to the services because that enables you to customize the demand. That is where a lot of the value creation is increasingly happening. Uh, and then the final point here is, is, is really that uh, I think what we're starting to see as well is that um, a lot of the competitiveness in these value chains depends on thinking about things which stick to your own country. So, um, uh, the, I mean, still some of these, these value chains can be relatively footloose. They, uh, things, things can move to, to other locations. And what a lot of, uh, I think, governments are trying to, to look at is basically, well, how can we make some of these things, things stick to, to, to a certain location? And, and what comes in there is, is, is the thinking about, um, and, and this is a curve which uh, some of you may have seen before. It's called the smiley curve. Uh, and this is basically trying to look at a simple value chain, uh, in this case in, in the electronics industry, and trying to see, well, where is the value really in, in this value chain? Um, uh, and, and I think what we, we, we're seeing is that more and more the value is really in the beginning, uh, where we have things like R&D, where we have design, and, and, and other sort of uh, uh, services which are, are, are and, and also uh, sometimes more complex components which are feeding in. And at the end, where we have services, marketing, and other things, which are also often more more high value added, whereas a lot of the things which are in the mi middle uh, and, and where assembly is taking place and some of the production is taking place may not be um, as, as as high value added in, in terms of what is uh, what is happening. Um, now, just to give you a couple of examples here, and and and, and just to uh, say, for instance, uh, a shoe, a sport shoe. Uh, very relatively cheap to make nowadays. Uh, a lot of this is, 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 is very much uh, produced in many Asian countries nowadays. A lot of the value is in the distribution. A lot of the value is in the branding uh, in, in, in sort of the, the, the marketing, which is related to the product. And we're starting to see that with more and more products that the value is, is, is not so much 
in uh, the production uh, itself, but in, in more um, complex uh, services, knowledge-related, intangible-related, uh, which allow companies to add value and also to help them to differentiate themselves from, from lower, from competitors. Um, I want to take you through this. I, I think a, 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 a point perhaps to to, to make on, on this, because I, I saw that the title of your uh, session or your conference was also on, on economic development. I think uh, there is also an argument about, well, uh, are these global value chains really making it easier for developing countries to become involved? And uh, the argument which uh, I think a lot of people have said, have made, is that perhaps it's easier uh, for, uh, for particularly for smaller developing countries to join the value chain, to basically say, well, let's get involved in a certain stage of the production pro process. Uh, because what we've seen sometimes in the past that countries have really tried to, do, to build up their own value chain, which is really expensive, really costly, and not something which is very easy to do. Uh, so what I think more and more countries are trying to do is say, well, let's get involved in a certain stage of the value chain and then at least it will give us access to knowledge, it will start us to, to, to get going. Um, but that means then that participation in these global value chains is, is really important so that these countries really need to think very carefully about their border policies, about their whole uh, business environment to make it easier for them to, to, to access. And then if you want to move up the value chain, you need to think about, well, uh, how you uh, sort of improve your skills, how you innovate in these things, and also how you can sort of um, uh, 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 move up over over time. Um, just to one example of a country which has been very active in this area is, is Costa Rica. This is a slide which was uh, presented by the Minister of Trade of Costa Rica at a conference we had in Mexico last year. Uh, and they were really trying to say, well, these are the types of things where we think we can really develop our own agenda by diversifying, participating in more um, uh, more global value chains to increase the types of things which we're doing, get more firms involved, then strengthen our global value chains by increasing our local content. And that doesn't necessarily mean for regulation, but really I think to try and sort of think about how you can sort of um, improve the quality and, and, and the types of services and, and, and product which you're, you're making. Uh, to strengthen the linkages with local suppliers and then to upgrade in terms of uh, innovation, science and technology uh, and focusing more on, on, on high skill tasks. Uh, so these are the, the, the types of discussions which I think uh, our, our work is, is currently leading to. And I, I just wanted to end, end with a couple of conclusions before I say a few words what we're, uh, we're, we're doing in terms of next steps. Uh, first, I think what our work really shows is that um, um, that there is a growing interconnectedness with the global uh, with the global economy, uh, so that we have openness. Uh, that what's really important is that you need this openness in in in, uh, in global value chains, not just with trade, but also in terms of investment. Uh, that imports nowadays are just as important for competitiveness than exports, and that in competitiveness is increasingly about what you do and not necessarily what you sell. So I think uh, the thing about thinking about tasks, thinking about stages, and thinking about activities is, 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 is something which I think a lot of firms, but sometimes also governments, are doing. Um, I already mentioned this importance of this intangible knowledge capital. I think this is something which we are, we're currently uh, working on at the moment to try and understand better this link between the investment in knowledge and the success that different countries have in, in these global value chains. And then finally, I think the whole issue of services, that these are really, really important because uh, that is enable you to differentiate, but they're also, this is where a lot of the value is being created. So uh, in many countries, this, I think, still requires thinking about uh, regulation to try and improve uh, the, the, the quality of, of, of the services sector over time. Uh, let me say a few words about this, the next steps in, in our work. Uh, we released uh, this database in, in, uh, in, in January last year and then a uh, revised version in, in May. Uh, we're currently trying to improve it, extend it, uh, trying to add more countries. Um, this will go slowly. A lot of countries actually don't have some of the required data, so we have to do this uh, slowly over time. Uh, more industries. We currently have about a uh, distinction of, of, of 17, 18 industries. We'll try to add about uh, 7, 8 to 10 uh, more uh, in the course of next year. 
uh, we're trying to look at not only at where value is being created, but also where employment is being generated in these value chains. Uh, we want to uh, look more closely at the link to investment. Uh, I mean, most of this is about trade, uh, but to better understand the role of multinationals and also try to understand where income is flowing in these global value chains, which is really difficult. Um, to try and better understand the link to uh, innovation and to also look a little bit at some of the future uh, trends which are happening in this, uh, in this area. Um, just to give you two final examples of work which we have just published last week, uh, we are now starting to look at well at uh, job creation, which is linked to these global value chains. So this is basically just looking at uh, the percentage of jobs in the business se sector which depend on foreign channel demand. So this is something which we can do uh, also with this data. Uh, so you see in countries like the United States and Brazil that about 10% of jobs in the business sector depend on foreign final demand. Uh, whereas in Germany, it's about 35%. So, um, of course, depending on the size of the economy and, 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 and also the share of trade. Uh, and we can also look at what are the regions where this demand is coming from. Uh, so, for instance, you can see that for a country like Japan, of course, a lot of the demand will come from, from East Asia, uh, whereas for uh, the United States, a lot of it will come from the NAFTA region. For European countries, obviously, a lot comes from European countries. So these are the types of things which we can explore in more detail and where we want to work on in the future. Uh, let me end by a little bit of advertising. These are just uh, a couple of links. This is a publication which we put out um, uh, earlier this year. Uh, where you can find a lot more detail with um, uh, chapters on trade policy, on investment policy, uh, and, and also explanation more on, on, on the database. Uh, you have a few links there on, uh, on, on to our website, uh, which gives you, uh, I think, uh, quite a, a bit more information about the work which we've done also with country notes, with, with data and indicators on uh, about 40 uh, countries, uh, all the OECD countries and the major BRICs and also a link to our scoreboard where we uh, have a lot more of the information which, uh, which is available in the database. And my final slide, just to thank you very much, and also if there's anything um, I cannot help you with straight away, don't hesitate to send me an email uh, later on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, we, we appreciate your, your, your long distance engagement. I'm uh, personally thrilled the technology worked, so thanks to the AV crew and everybody here at CSIS for making this work, and, and uh, Dirk, your uh, team at uh, the OECD. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. I, I kind of feel like that Far Side cartoon where the guy holds up his hand and says, may I leave? My brain is full. <laughs> okay. Hearing none, we'll move on, but thank you again, Dirk. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Good luck. And uh, for those of you who talk to congressmen about, uh, uh, about uh, tr bilateral trade deficits, give them a copy of Dirk's report, The Interconnected Economies. It's a fabulous, uh, easily accessible document on how this thing actually works. Let me now invite our second panel to come up to the front. We're going to shift gears here anywhere you'd like. Take it. We're going to shift gears from the, the uh, policy and, uh, and theory to the practice. Uh, and uh, delighted to welcome uh, three panelists uh, who can choose the order of their speaking, but uh, let me introduce them in alphabetical order. Paul Delaney is partner at Kyle House Group and has a fascinating career in the supply chain business. He was uh, uh, worked at the uh, U.S. Trade Representative's office worked as International Trade Council on the Senate Finance Committee, and in between those assignments was, a, was an attorney for FedEx Express, and now does uh, work in uh, global supply chains for the Kyle House Group. Uh, Shabana Faruqi is Director, Private Sector, or Public Sector Advocacy Services for PricewaterhouseCoopers. She has a, specializes in supply chain management and has deep knowledge of developing economy health sector in particular, which she'll talk about. And finally, Sarah Thorne, Senior Director of Federal Government Relations for Walmart Stores. Uh, Sarah's company, Walmart, is one of the most sophisticated supply chain operators on the planet. But Sarah herself is, has led the team that developed Walmart's Women's Empowerment Initiative. So thank you for coming, and uh, we welcome you.
Okay, is that on? Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you, CSIS, again for the invitation today. And um, as Scott mentioned, I've actually been, I guess, blessed to, to work on a number of these issues, both at the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, uh, at FedEx, and at the Senate Finance Committee. So the global value chain and, and some of what I'm going to talk about, the global supply chain issues and how they interrelate, uh, I think are viewed quite differently um, from the policymakers or the legislators uh, as it is from the businesses. You know, as we heard uh, throughout this morning, we really have seen a sea change uh, in terms of the, the scope and the scale of trade. Uh, I was, came across a number about global GDP, how it doubled between year zero and year 1500, and then doubled again between 1500 and 1800, and then doubled again between 1800 and 1900, and then quadrupled between 1900 and 2000. And the last 10 years, even putting aside the global, uh, the Great Recession, has seen even, even more rapid growth. Uh, as you heard from the presentations this morning, the, one of these phenomenons has been the, the development of the global value, value chain and then also the disaggregation of value chains. You don't see the sort of vertically integrated uh, you know, export USA or export China or whatever platform that you saw in the past. And this new phenomenon has really created unprecedented opportunities for the developing world because as you break up those into a series of pieces. I think as someone said, uh, as companies become more nimble and can actually shift different aspects of the value chain to different markets or different companies, that really does create a, a whole new set of opportunities for the developing world. And frankly, you know, the developing world is predominantly made up of very small or SME type businesses. So that disaggregation again, gives them an opportunity that they've not had in the past. So at this moment where we see this, this disaggregation, we also see shifting demand trends. Um, so from a FedEx boardroom perspective, when I used to work with my colleagues down in Memphis, there are whole business strategic uh, divisions that all they're looking at is where is the shifting demand and for what? And what we're seeing is, is the rise of Asia, uh, you know, the rise in, in Latin America and elsewhere. As that new middle class is created, these supply chains, these global value chains will be reaching hundreds of millions of new consumers. So that creates a whole new set of issues and challenges, one being geography. Uh, one of the things you learn at FedEx very quickly is where you're located is essential. And you want to be located in the middle of activity. Uh, Fred Smith was famous for creating the hub spoke model. If you go to Memphis on any night, you can see 15,000 workers between 11 and 2 in the morning helping manage the 160 some odd jets that are landing every 45 seconds, offloading millions of packages in 22 minutes, having them resorted on a thousand vehicles being reloaded onto these planes and the planes taking off going all throughout the world. That new model was, was predicated on this idea. If you look at Memphis, Memphis is actually centrally located in terms of where the economic activity in the United States is. And there's other hubs in Alaska and California and elsewhere. So this new opportunity of new demand, new consumers um, presents the developing world who, who for geographic reasons may be more closely uh, located to where the new growth is. One of the things that I was struck by from the private sector time and working with colleagues in, in other sectors is that technologically there, there truly are no limits. I mean, with ICT, transportation and delivery services, we have the capacity to design, manufacture, and distribute and sell anything, anywhere, almost in real time. So what we can do has no limits from the capacity side, but what we can do is dramatically constrained by the types of, we've heard about this earlier today, trade, investment, regulatory, customs, other barriers that are making it difficult to deploy that full range of, of services or, or uh, technology around the world. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to focus on one key element of, from really more of the corporation perspective of how do you use global value chains to ignite and spur development. And I think we need to look at how or why are certain countries not able to participate in the global economy and get into those global value chains. And often that can be really tied directly towards the inability to plug into the global supply chain. And what I mean by that is, again, as you've disaggregated these pieces of the value chain, as you do what's called just-in-time manufacturing. So you may have a product that has components 
that were manufactured and assembled in 15 countries, that requires a transportation and ICT uh, logistics infrastructure to maintain that supply chain. So if you're going to plug into it, there are certain fundamentals that you have to address in terms of customs modernization, in terms of services liberalization, which was mentioned earlier, so that companies can actually provide that full suite of services to help those developing countries and their small businesses and their workers play a role in that global supply chain. So that I, I know we've only plenty of time for questions. So the only thing I would, I would sort of leave you all with is, is, one, is to consider this, that the value chains have disaggregated and are nimble and are sort of network-based and are flexible. The companies, when they choose to invest, it's really a binary choice. So it's the whole range of policies, investment climate, regulatory customs, what I need to do, what I need to do for that piece of the value chain exists in the country or it does not. So looking at all of those policy areas holistically is really the change in thinking that has to happen both for US policymakers as they do trade negotiations and look at development policy, but also for the developing countries themselves. That as they identify the sectors that they want to attract for foreign investment, they need to look at what are the customs, investment, uh, services, transportation, what are the types of constraints in a regulatory framework that exist and maybe you know, historic or traditional type systems that they've inherited, what are those barriers that are preventing them from helping that company make the decision that yes, they have taken all of the steps that are necessary, they have reached that tipping point, and therefore we are gonna help and include them, I think some of my colleagues will talk about this, include their businesses, their workers, as part of that value chain. So, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Slide back. <laughs> this is working now. Okay, well thanks, and that's a great introduction. Um, so I work with Walmart. Walmart is a pretty big company. We're about a $470 billion company now. We operate in 26 markets around the world. We have over 2 million people who work with us. Um, and one of the things we've been working on over the last several years is now that we are such a big concern, now that we are such a global company, how do we use that scale for good? Because oftentimes in our history, and continuing anybody who lives in Washington, D.C. will know, um, you know, when you are very big, the reputation of your company becomes almost a lightning uh, rod for every issue and every social issue. Um, and also, um, one of the things we've recognized pretty clearly is because of our scale, we can't exhaust resources. We actually have to be building resources and we have to be thinking sustainably about how we operate. Um, and so when we started looking at these issues of development, we talked to a lot of people and a lot of our critics, and we talked about what are the assets that we bring to this issue. Um, and really, they're pretty simple. We buy a lot, and we have a lot of jobs. So what's the delta in terms of helping people figure out how they either sell to us um, and sell to us locally and globally, or how they get one of our jobs? And retail jobs are actually great training ground for future jobs because you don't need a lot of professional training to do a retail job. We'll train you on the job. Um, but you do need to know certain things about how you show up, what, how you dress, what is customer service, those soft skills that actually in the long run help us succeed in any job that we have. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to you to, to really walk through today is just a couple of case studies and how we're working on this issue of value chains and development. Um, the role we're playing, and then some of the policy area takeaways that we've seen as we've started to work in this space. So in that area of jobs, you know, one of the things that we've really been focused on is how do we get more SMEs into our, into our value chain? In many of the emerging economies in which we operate, um, obviously SMEs are the predominant um, economic force. Um, and so, but we're set up as a big, large, multinational retailer. So we're set up to work on scale. We're set up to buy a lot and to sell it at a lower price. And so working with SMEs requires us to rethink how we work um, 
in the environments in which we're working because essentially when you're working with smaller companies they have smaller volume and sometimes higher prices. But the benefit of working with smaller industries is that you get a locally tailored product and more importantly to us is you're benefiting the local communities. So as a global company, one of the things we want in every environment in which we operate is the people and the communities around those stores to actually have incomes in their pockets so that they'll shop at our stores. And one of the things we figured out pretty quickly is this, if we invest in women, women will reinvest in their families and their communities. Women will hire other women, women will mentor other women, women will train other women. So one of the areas that we're particularly focused on, as Scott mentioned, is helping women entrepreneurs succeed. So this is a program that we have in Central America called Una Mano Para Crecer, sort of a hand to help, where we recognize that if we were going to succeed in Central America, we needed to figure out this big, small issue. Um, and so the program is actually pretty simple. Um, we help and we work with local governments, we work with local associations to actually bring the SMEs into Walmart through local fairs. Um, and then once you're in the program, we do a couple of things to help SMEs succeed. We accelerate financing, so we do payments that are a little faster than the normal payment process because one of the biggest issues we've found for entrepreneurs and for small businesses is access to finance and capital flows. Um, we help them distribute their products so they can drop up for a cost a product at a distribution center and we can get it as opposed to saying that a small producer needs to do direct st store delivery. And we train them. One of the biggest challenges we've found for some of our smaller entrepreneurs is an issue of packaging. That you can go to the store and actually walk the store and say SME, SME or PME, PME, PME because the packaging just isn't the same as um, a, a multinational brand. Um, so how do you help with those basic skills to help these folks get in? And what's interesting about Leticia, she was the supplier of the year a couple of years ago, SME supplier of the year in Central America, is one of the things that we found is it's really hard to take Leticia and sell her right now to the U.S. stores. There, there are big barriers in terms of scale capacity, um, barriers to trade, standards, and issues. But if she can scale locally with us, if she can start working in Central America, and then start exporting to local other economies in Central America, sort of Guatemala. And then she think, can think about innovation and diversification, because one of the challenges we find with SMEs is they produce one product, and it's probably the product they knew how to produce when they were making them in their kitchen. But when you're selling to a modern retailer, you need to have and think about innovation for the customer, because it's always about the customer. So she can innovate. She started with platanitas. Now she's doing potato chips. She can diversify her brand. She can get that capital flows. And so actually create the development to the global value chain by, by essentially starting local and then glowing global. And this is the same for the farmers we work with. It's, it's true that you know if you're going to work with Walmart, you probably need a barcode. You need to do, know how to do electronic data interchange. You need to be thinking about how you work in the modern um, retail space. So starting local and going global is probably, a, for us, we've seen as a better development effect. Um, the next uh, case study I wanted to sort of showcase is um, a product, a program that we put together on our dot-com site called Empowering Women Together. One of the things that we thought of when we put this program together was, you know, we have this amazing ability to showcase some of these great work from women artisans and women collectives and cooperatives on our dot-com site and to expose these folks to U.S. customers and global customers. Um, one of the things we'd seen in working in the past with some development agencies is we were very project oriented. So we'll do, we'll work with, you know, maybe a development agency and we'll help this collective in this country and they'll create some nice jewelry for us and we'll take one order. And, and in some ways that's, that, that isn't a very good development product project because it's not per se sustainable. You've built up this capacity, but you're chasing orders. So how do we create longer term relationships with collectives and cooperatives? How do we create more sustainable value chains so you're creating, in, you know, you're helping them essentially develop to know consumer taste and preference, shipping, um, what are the kinds of things we need to do to actually sell sustainably into the market as opposed to one-offs? Um, and so this is a group, Kahaya Links, that is in Rwanda. They started actually making peace baskets years back. Um, the, the women who founded Kahaya Links are amazing. They actually were working first in a cafeteria, and they saw so many people coming in who didn't have food to eat, so they were basically giving away all of their food in their cafe and said, there has to be a better way. Many of the women they started with were HIV positive, and they needed money to buy their antiretroviral, the virus, uh, the drugs. And so 
they started making, basically helping and linking to the markets. One of the things we've done with them is to say, you know, we know the U.S. Cons customer. So if you actually cut a design and a pattern in a way that we know this maxi dress is going to sell or we know what color's on trend, we can actually help you link better to the customer and create a product that people are going to buy more than once and come back to um, and showcase it on our dot-com site. The one thing that we've learned from this experiment, though, is that big, big, big multinationals aren't always best place for working at the base of the pyramid. One of the things we had to do is actually get an intermediary aggregator who could help us, an NGO, kind of translate our standards for suppliers, our requirements for shipping, our EDI, and help them learn and hopefully create kind of angel brokers who then will pass them on directly to us because there was just too much of a delta between us and them. One of the other things we've learned, and no, sorry, no disregard to FedEx, is, is air shipment just eats your margin. So a lot of these folks, while they have a great product, Getting transportation and logistics hubs in a lot of these places is going to be the most important thing in figuring out how you create a sustainable value chain where every chain, every part of the value chain is making profit. Um, and then tariffs and issues like that. You know, these folks are making apparel, and yet we have, I see my friends out there, we have the worst regressive tariff system, and it's a tax on the poorest people here in the United States and the poorest producers where we're charging the most on the least. So we need to think about the policy implications of development in the trade system. And very quickly, the last thing I mentioned is our jobs. You know, one of the things that we figured out pretty quickly when we went into India was there's just incredible amounts of talent but have never been really trained for working in the formal economy. Same thing in Brazil. Wonderful, lots of youth, but aren't really skilled or trained well to work in our stores. And so we started to partner with local governments, local NGOs to create what we call social retail schools. Um, that are largely soft skills, but also some, how do you run a cash register, what do you do with inventory, so that we can get these folks into our stores and train them ourselves, because in, like in many retailers, 74% of our managers come from our hourly pool, so we'll train you, but you have to get in and you have to know how to succeed. And so the, it's really interesting, um, Amandeep started, she's actually now entered into an MBA program, um, but, you know, these schools are actually giving a lot of hope to folks because we're actually training them not just to train numbers, but for the jobs that exist. And so we're taking this kind of um, approach, and Nancy Lee was here in the morning working with IDB and others to say, we've got this curriculum, we have this capacity. How do we take that and take all the other multinationals in the Americas who have jobs and try to scale this at cost um, and do essentially the most good for the least amount of money, which is what we're trying to figure out. So this is just a snapshot about how some multinationals are thinking about global value chains and developments. I think my key takeaways are, you know, one of the big challenges is how do you become locally relevant? For us, that means being a little smaller and a little more relevant to the pool of folks that we're working with. Two, this is good business. It's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. We really do want the communities we serve to be self-sufficient, to have disposable income, to grow and develop. And so we have a role in that, in thinking more inclusively about how we all grow together. And third is if we don't get the policy environment right, everything we do will stay local and small. You know, we have incredible opportunities now with a globally interconnected world, but we have a system that's sort of set up for an older world. And so we need to actually work on the policy framework to make sure that these people, as, they, as our, these, we're pulling these people in as they're growing and they're developing, have the opportunity to become global players. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Shabana. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you all, and thank you to CSIS for giving PwC the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I wanted to build on, I think, many of the comments that have come from the different presenters today, um, but talk a little bit more specifically about how can we help make local companies more competitive so that they can participate in higher value activities um, within the supply chain. Because right now we're seeing uh, developing economies not capitalizing as much as they could um, because they don't have the capabilities or the capacity to participate in, in those higher value activities. Um, and specifically I'd like to touch on three key areas. One is on um, strengthening supply chains, another is on developing manufacturing capabilities and capacity at the local level, 
And then finally, on um, implementing responsible business practices. Um, so the first one, and my background, as Scott alluded to when we first introduced me, my background has been focusing on healthcare supply chains. And so I'm going to draw on that quite a bit as, as I talk, briefly. Um, in the medical technologies industry, we're seeing a lot of south-south, north-south acquisitions, um, looking primarily for the, for the following benefits. Uh, providing access to technologies that are tailored to local requirements. Um, but also providing access to distribution channels uh, and distribution infrastructure, um, as well as service and repair capabilities that the local firms currently have that MNCs would like to take advantage of. Um, so when you're looking at where in the supply chain might uh, you focus system strengthening activities on, uh, these are some key areas for consideration. Another point within the health sector is that you have quite a Within the health sector, you have a parallel public sector supply chain system as well as a private sector supply chain system. And you'll see development organizations are focusing quite a lot of money and effort uh, trying to strengthen public sector supply chains. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about is potentially uh, diverting some of that funding that's going towards propping up public sector supply chains that are often quite inefficient um, in their operations and potentially think about and redistributing that money to focus on private sector um, supply chains so we're strengthening those activities. Areas that, that we see weaknesses in public sector supply chains, particularly in the health sector, is in, in areas around inventory management and distribution um, and, and warehousing. Um, and these are some areas where private sector organizations can, um, can instead take that funding, strengthen their own channels, and then serve as valuable members of the global value chain. Um, human resources is another key constraint in the, in, the, um, in the developing world. What you are finding is supply chain is not a core competency uh, for many. It's not really a, um, a core competency. It's not, it's not something that is in the core curriculum. Uh, you have supply chain managers that do not have supply chain skills. We've spent a lot of time trying to build these supply chain skills, particularly for folks operating healthcare value chains or supply chains. Um, we do find in the private sector, um, I have PwC has worked with organizations in both the private and the public sector to try to strengthen healthcare supply chains. Um, and you do find quite an appetite at the private sector level to to take in you know, these lessons learned because you have that incentive to do so, that commercial incentive to go ahead and strengthen supply chains. Um, that incentive, not so much necessarily there at the public sector level. Um, the incentive at the public sector level is to make sure that, um, that countries are kind of meeting uh, the minimum requirements imposed on them by donors so that they're receiving funding. And so we do see uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of will within private sector to kind of take these lessons learned um, from, from multinational organizations, multilateral organizations, um, to strengthen their own supply chains. And so I think that much of the money that's being spent trying to, pro to, um, to enhance and strengthen public sector supply chains could instead potentially reap more benefits if, they, if that money has been diverted to, to private sector. Uh, manufacturing, we do work quite a bit with, with manufacturing, particularly in heavily regulated industries such as the healthcare industry. Um, challenges associated with, with this is that local companies do not have the quality processes in place um, to meet international standards and regulations. Um, and and that limits them, their ability to kind of participate in these global value chains. Um, PwC does quite a lot of work trying to get firms up to, to speed to be able to, uh, to meet international requirements such as FDA regulations, CE marks, um, getting them towards ISO 9000 standards even though they may not be able to, to, to meet that, um, but at least to start to develop these quality systems processes so you have consistency in manufacturing. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'd like to talk about is um, minimizing business risk. Um, this is an area where 
I will say I am not an expert, but uh, so if you do have questions, let's not focus on this one. Um, but I, I mean, in areas, another thing that precludes local participation in value chain is um, are things related to ethics, labor, health and safety, and environmental concerns. Uh, and I think that's definitely an area, and you've seen this in the news quite a bit, um, uh, garment uh, with, with child labor, with uh, the fires in, in India, garment factories. Um, it's, it's, it's exceedingly important that these local firms receive some kind of, receive guidance in terms of how, how are you able to meet these minimum um, requirements around, around these key areas to make sure that MNCs that would partner with them are not risking their reputation by partnering with them. And so th that's one area where we don't see a lot of focus, at least in the health sector, um, a lot of emphasis to work with, with local organizations to kind of help them get up to speed with that regard. Um, and so, you know, happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks. What I'd like to do is open the floor for questions again. Uh, again, rem remember, wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, and ask a question. Yes, sir. Hi, David Mack from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, I actually do have a question on that last component, so sorry about that. Um, mainly, how are big companies, you know, like FedEx, like Walmart, uh, managing their risk and compliance issues in their global supply chains, given increasing pressures from anti-corruption legislation, such as foreign, uh, sorry, foreign Corrupt Practices Act, UK Anti-Bribery Act, and how does this affect MNCs in their decision to enter new markets and introduce new suppliers into their value chains? Thanks. Sure. Um, Excellent question, and, and I think certainly from my former colleagues that the FCPA is sort of front and center. When you're a company that's servicing 220 countries and territories around the world, uh, you know, by definition, you're, you're into markets where there, there are some issues. Um, certainly from a global logistics service provider's perspective, this very much, I think, goes to the point of, of the difficulty that some of the developing countries have participating in the global value chain because there are a number of in-country folks, there's the legal teams looking at these issues. So you know, when a FedEx comes in and is going to service a market, that interaction with the customs authority has to all be documented, has to all be handled in a very careful way. Um, sometimes that means the customs authority won't cooperate. Um, sometimes it means packages just get held up for an inordinate period of time. Um, the end result of that is that the footprint of FedEx or UPS or DHL is going to be quite small, um, and the ability of the, the, the consumers and the businesses in that economy, in that developing country, to participate in these global value chains is going to be dramatically diminished. Um, so it, it is, it's a front and center issue. Um, I think one of the things that's, that, that I find interesting is that as you see the discussions about sustainable development and, and what are the sort of the key elements or the key kind of reforms that you need, you know, that the strengthening of rule of law is always, you know, first and foremost, one of the key elements. That also will always be a top priority for the private sector um, because that commitment to rule of law, that commitment to open regulatory regimes and transparency allows a, a larger company, whether it's a logistic provider or, or another company setting up its supply chain, to have the confidence, you know, to, to scale up because it can help navigate those FCPA and other issues. Yeah, just to add to that, obviously compliance is paramount. Yeah. I think um, we're sort of seeing a very interesting phenomenon now where the end of the chain is, is seen to by many, many stakeholders to be absolutely responsible right. for the beginning of the chain, even before it actually comes out of the ground. So um, that, that's a real challenge for us because the, the systems and processes that we've built generally go sort of one back or two back. And so issues like the Lacey Act or conflict minerals or some of these new well-intentioned um, laws that we support the goal of, which is don't put conflict minerals in your electronics, um, I think we need to think about how, what the consequences of some of those are given the enforcement systems that exist. Because the last thing you want, which is in fact what's happening now in the Congo, is people saying, I just don't source from there because I can't, the, the, the infrastructure is not such that I can guarantee that it's safe. 
Um, and so I do think it takes a, it's going to take a little bit more of that stakeholder dialogue to say, what are the right approaches here? How far back does the end have responsibility for the beginning? And what are the right levers in terms of working collectively against these common goals of everybody wants to work in a decent, safe um, environment, be paid appropriately, have the right rules, et cetera? Especially also where you have governments that have abdicated that role. What's the role of the private sector? What are the role of the governments? What are the role of the international organizations? I think we're getting there. I think the transparency of the internet and the real time of information is forcing us to actually accelerate our approach in that area. But I think it's probably something that we probably holistically need to address a little bit better. And I would just add from a donor perspective, I think it's shifting the focus of the discussion. Um, and, and as I turn to allude to, is that a lot of the focus is really on public-private partnerships to strengthen public sector um, capabilities. Uh, and I think if, if you are um, changing the course of the discussion to say there is a huge role for the private sector in development, uh, but not only that, these are some issues that they're struggling with. Could multilateral organizations and development organizations not start to maybe um, dedicate some other resources towards addressing these issues? which, in my experience, it's not really been the main priority. Yeah, we have the right over here, front row. Jerry Jensen, Business Driven Development. Um, I wondered, none of you addressed um, how you could leverage, how and whether you've been able to leverage U.S. development agencies in sustainable supply chains. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you've done it, and more importantly, what are the opportunities going forward? So we've actually had a, a very robust engagement with U.S. development agencies, international development agencies, as well as multilateral institutions. It's been an evolving partnership. I think we've had to, to work through what's the right point of entry for us in terms of on the ground um, relationship building. For example, with USAID, in the past, I think the, the concept of public-private partnership was, I've got some money, you've got some money, let's do a project. And we've been shifting to say, actually, what's much more interesting about us is not um, my money, but my business. And so in Central America, we have, we have a couple of framework agreements, and we just signed last month another global MOU with USAID to say, we really actually need to think about business-enabled philanthropy, which is you know a tricky term, but, but also, it's, we have a, are so well positioned as an off-taker, so you're training a lot of farmers. Train them on our standards or on the standard that is common to many global retailers. Um, we'll tell you what products we actually want. We'll help you think through the life cycle of that product in terms of let's not have all every, everything ripen on the same day, but we're going to need these for September, March, April, May, June. What kind of supply, you know, how much should you be planting so you're not oversupplying and driving down your prices, et cetera? What are the market demands? And so I've started to, to sort of think about this a little bit as demand-driven development, which is start with the market first. So if you're, if you're devising a, a training program for the youth bulge, which is everywhere, right? What are the job requirements and where are the jobs and train back into the system or you know who who are the off takers it's not just us it's energy companies it's you know the all of the consumer product companies that have really recognized that and it goes back to our enlightened self-interest which is i need fresher safer products i don't have the capability to train all these farmers on my own why don't i partner in an area that there's a mutual benefit and we were talking earlier you know one of the things we have people coming and saying, you're a great logistics company. Let's partner in logistics. We're like, eh, we don't really need a lot of help. <laughs> so let's look for that sweet spot where we're getting something and we're getting to that same mutual development goal. Um, so I would, I would take a, a different angle. I think that was, that was very helpful. Um, but I feel as a uh, development organization, kind of to your point, had initially public-private partnerships kind of seen it as a, a bit opportunistic. Um, and now there's a shifting environment where development organizations are, are really kind of, there are two things going on. One, I mean, they're facing competition in terms of budgets, um, but also they are held more accountable more and more towards outcomes. Um, and so they're looking at the supply chain as a whole system from a system approach. And because of that, they need to 
become more innovative. But I think we're kind of at the front end of, of this and a recognition that they need to view the, the supply chain and, and, and come up with some innovative solutions. Um, but I think as part of that kind of adopting um, working better with the private sector is going to be key over the next like 10, 20 years. I just, but I feel as though it's, it, it's kind of a shift and it, it's fairly immature. Um, we're at an immature stage right now. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I would, I would agree with, with both sets of comments. And I think that it's important to think or, or consider that, you know, we'll start with US-based companies. They've been in every country in the world. Some U.S. company has been there, you know, for decades and has been competing and doing something, you know, whether it's selling a product or providing a service, and they provide an immense amount of experience in the market. And now, what we're seeing with the disaggregation of the value chain is that, you know, companies are rapidly expanding their footprint in a whole range of company, or countries all around the world at different levels of development, different culturally, with different types of challenges. And you know, whether it's a FedEx logistics engineer who has to figure out, okay, how do I get these products out of this region to this airport or to this port to get on a, uh, a, a ship through freight forwarding, that's all they're doing is trying to figure out the answers to these questions. Unfortunately, I think I agree that this is sort of, we're in the, the nation phase of this that immense amount of talent and resource and experience has not been where the development agencies went to first. Um, and I think that's going to be a big shift in how we approach these questions. Um, you know, there's a statistic that I find striking that in, in 1960 or 61, and the CSIS report and others have noted that it was nearly 80% of the public dollars going to the developing world for the United States were, were public dollars. And today it's 9%. So the entire, the game is in private investment flows. Now whether it's coming from state-owned enterprises or private entities or companies or financing, that's where the activity is. That's what's gonna determine the development track of these different countries. And the private sector's presence in those countries is only getting more and more involved. I mean, Walmart and others tapping into that experience and those best practices and those core competencies to shape how the development community, which is very important, and these, and these agencies that are very important, to really prioritize where they focus their resources, there's an opportunity here, but we have to really seize it. It hasn't been done, I think, effectively yet. Thank you. There's a question up front here. Hi, thank you for some excellent presentations. My name is Catherine Bertram. I'm with Johns Hopkins. Um, I have a question mainly for Sarah, but I guess for anybody really. Um, it's uh, mostly regarding your, um, the way that you measure the impact of, of your programs, and I was just curious how you do that, um, specifically around sort of the community benefits and how that sort of filters down to the, um, the company. Yeah. And also, just to sort of add on to that, um, I work for the School of Public Health, so I'm interested in, in health, so sorry for imposing my agenda here, but um, I was just curious, from a business perspective, in this, within this conversation, does health, does health play a role, and if so, um, you know, how does that uh, work with, within the projects that you're doing? So um, I think we're, we're in that transformation on, on measuring outputs and outcomes. So when we set a lot of these goals, we set really big ambitious goals, train a million farmers, source a billion from smallholder farmers, you know, double our sourcing from women-owned businesses. That's because businesses understand numbers, and I was the one taking these big decks to our CEO and saying, we need to support this, and they'd kind of focus on the one number. Well, what about this 20 billion, you know? Um, you kind of have to do that. And it also is a guide, it's a guiding principle. Um, what's more interesting to me is the systemic change that you have to go through to actually get to big numbers. So we do measure outputs. What we're starting to measure more is this concept of outcomes. So okay, so you trained a million farmers, so you doubled your sourcing from women in businesses. What does that actually mean in a tangible sense? And what we're finding is that the outcomes are broader and that's sometimes more diffuse. So we're training a lot of women in factories because we notice that you can't really think about women's economic empowerment and not think about those women have been working in those factories in, in, in apparel largely and in jewelry somewhat. Um, 
So one of the things we said was, you know, those women probably, they, we just haven't really thought through what, what are the opportunities they need, and a lot of it is actually communication skills to think about self-esteem and self-worth and to ask about the things you need. At, and then to understand your role in the business if you're working on a line, what is my participation vis-a-vis -vis your participation. Health is a big component of that and hygiene is a big component of that as well, as well as how do you manage the money that you have. One of the more interesting things, and we have um, DAI and um, academic institutions looking at the evaluation of this particular program, is that the, the, the benefits of that have actually translated more into the community and how the women speak to their husbands and how they look at what's happening and why am I working in the factory and taking care of the kids and, you know, that... Get off the couch. There should be some more... <laughs> So, so that's the kind of thing because that's an outcome. So that's something, you know, Sylvia Burwell was, for a very brief time, the head of our foundation, uh, Matthews, and uh, so that's something that we're now thinking about. We've never really thought of ourselves as a development institution or doing development. So, um, you know, we're really, really thinking now about how do we measure, how do we replicate, how do we scale, how do we leverage? So taking that business mindset to the, what we're doing in this space. In, yes. in, in the health sector to address that, that comment, I mean, I think it's very difficult to end up actually, um, most of the multilateral organizations are struggling to, to determine how do you link outcomes. Like if you're looking at outcomes like reduced morbidity and mortality for a specific disease, how do you link that to a specific program? I mean, that's a harder thing to, to, to correlate. Um, but, and I would say that probably one of the things you've mentioned is there needs to be a shared benefit for an organization like Walmart to get involved. Um, and so you do see a lot of these um, pharma companies or medical device companies partnering with um, development organizations to help um, strengthen infrastructure in countries so then ultimately right, to benefit their own bottom line. But that's, how, that's where you would see that engagement in, in the health community. Have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. I'm a Jennifer Bremer with DAI, um, and uh, one of the things that I've seen, but I wanted to see whether you guys agree that this is going on, is companies facing the policy challenges or structural challenges and recognizing that they can't do that alone and moving more towards collective action and forming alliances as in Bangladesh or to, to, to address these things, especially governance failures where safety in numbers uh, and hopefully better impact, but I wonder if you're seeing the same thing. Sure, I mean, I, one of the things that was most interesting during the time when I was uh, with FedEx is that their partnerships with their customers in country were invaluable assets in trying to make policy reforms in country. Um, so when the logistics provider partners with their customers, whether it's, it's a Walmart or whether it's Tata in India or whether it's a small businessman, whoever it may be, and, and sort of can then with that cross-sectoral focus and, and strength, say, look, this policy or this governance issue or this customs issue or this structural reform is not about empowering a U.S. multinational company. It's about connecting your sort of poster childs of, of success to the world economy. So I, I, I definitely think, I think that when companies and industries work together at, at all scales are much more effective both in U.S. policy advocacy and, and abroad. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the Bangladesh issue you're referring to is sort of a sea change in the fact that many of the companies have been trying to work together for a long time and share information about audits and social compliance and these issues. I think the um, severity of the issues there forced collective action, I would say, in a very um, accelerated time frame because you needed to share your data on what factors you're in. What are the audits? The audits are, if you're doing a structural audit, which companies never thought in some ways was their responsibility to say, I need to actually, I don't own this factory. I don't even, I contract with a supplier who contracts with the factory owner, but somehow I'm, like I said, responsible for the integrity of that building, which in many ways is actually a government function to ensure that they're built to code. Um, but given that we had committed to do that, the best way to do it was to work together and share the data because you don't need to audit a structure 20 times. You need to actually have one really good credible audit you can share. So it's forced some collective action that I think we'll still see how do you continue that.
to address other larger societal issues if if this is a if this is a structure because it is a the way it's set up it's set up on collaboration working with the LO working with the USG working with the Accord trying to figure out collectively how do we address these is issues. Well, let me close by thanking you all for coming and spending the morning with us. I uh, hope this was worth your uh, time and energy, and please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>